accusations. She said Meghan was selfish, somebody who wasn't suitable to be a royal, and a shallow social climber. Bust ups. And every family keeps quiet about where their skeletons are. This family hasn't. They've brought their skeletons out and they've dragged them through the streets. And an increasingly bitter feud. She owes this family respect just because she's suddenly a duchess doesn't mean that all of that is eroded and, and isn't important anymore. After the dream romance, the nightmare fallout. What's happened is a commoner has married into the royal family and it's created fireworks. I've got to say, this has probably been the biggest circus that I've ever come across. Now, with a new royal baby on the way, can Meghan and her family make up? The baby has a grandfather who he or she is in danger of never meeting. And if there's any chance of reconciliation there, I think all parties should be trying to grasp it. Hi, Mr. Thomas. Will Harry finally get to meet his father-in-law? For them not to have met each other seems quite absurd. And after all the rows, insults and embarrassments, can the Windsors ever be friends with the Markles? At the time, I know that they were kind of tearing their hair out. What on earth do we do with this family? If it's embarrassing to the British royal family, it's more embarrassing to us. May 19th, 2018, and the world's media descend on Windsor for the UK's biggest social event of the year. The marriage of Prince Harry to American actress Meghan Markle. It attracted VIPs from around the world. A-list celebrities and generations of royals from the Queen downwards. But among the 600 guests in the chapel, just one member of Meghan's family was present, her mother. You know, once you've gotten over the shock of seeing Oprah and the Cloonies and the Beckhams and all the, the star-studded guests, you then realise that actually it was pretty extraordinary that there was one solitary figure in that front pew, and that was Doria. My heart just swelled for her. I just thought, what an incredible woman you are. But I also felt very, very sad for her, and I thought it was just extraordinary that there was no other family member there. I found it just, yeah, unfathomable. Megan herself arrived alone. She must have been nervous inside. I mean, we're all nervous, but what was incredible was how she managed to cover up those nerves, how she managed to conduct herself, hold herself. She managed to smile. She managed to look quite coy and bride-like, but I think we realised the image she was putting forward. And then halfway down, she was met by the Prince of Wales. And it was a very kind and touching gesture. It was, it was very theatrical doing it that way. I don't think Charles filled in in any sense in the emotional support. I think it was more of a practical walking up the aisle. Someone had to walk her up the aisle. He was doing something, stepping into a situation where it should have been her father. Thomas Markle blamed his absence from his daughter's wedding on serious heart problems. He's since recovered, but their relationship has not. I think as far as Meghan is concerned, it was unforgivable that her father wasn't at her wedding day. And I think that's probably why the relationship is as unhinged as it is now, because it really did drive a wedge. There's clearly a very, very deep rift there. This relationship is, is, is you know, a bad one at the moment and obviously needs to be patched up. How's she feeling? This is a man who's ground down with hurt and uh, who doesn't really know where to turn. All I, all I can say is that uh, I'm here, she knows it, uh, and I've reached out to her and I need her to reach back to me. It's a gaping wound in the marriage of Meghan and, and Harry, and it's a wound that I believe they should try and heal at some point in, in the very near future. Uh, I love her very much. The public split between father and daughter was as quick as it was surprising. Ever since achieving fame, Meghan had gone out of her way to praise her upbringing in Los Angeles. You know, at the end of the day, I'm really just proud of who I am and where I come from. She had a very happy childhood. Both of her parents were very committed to her, to them as a family unit, and so she herself paints a picture of a pretty happy childhood. And actually, if you talk to members of Meghan's family, they will tell you that...
Doria and Thomas did everything they possibly could to support their daughter. I think our dad was very integral in her imagination, her development. He was very funny and creative. They were very, very close. I would say, you know, not more so than her mom was, but in different ways, maternal and paternal ways. But my dad has a fantastic sense of humor, so he could easily make her laugh and get involved in stories and playtime in a very theatrical way. I mean, I won't say she didn't have it in herself naturally, but I think it's largely my dad who encouraged her to explore creativity and being an actress. As well as offering his advice and encouragement, Thomas Markle is a lighting director in Hollywood. And following a win on the state lottery, he ensured his youngest daughter had the best education possible. Megan went to some of the most expensive schools on the planet. She went to the Little Red Schoolhouse, which was uh, attended by all kinds of celebrities like Johnny Depp's kids. She went to Immaculate Heart, a Catholic school, again, quite an expensive school. And then finally, she ended up at Northwestern University, one of the most expensive colleges in America, if not the world. It's something like $70,000 a year to go there. Meg was fast-tracked from being in really good schools. My dad was happy to be able to give her that in her life, to give her that advantage, and, um, and so proud of it. And I felt that that was special of him, and he never wanted anything back. He just wanted to see her blossom. After graduating from college, Megan began a new role as a struggling Hollywood actress. For almost a decade, she auditioned for bit parts in movies, ads, and game shows. Until getting her big break in the TV legal drama Suits, her mother and father had backed her throughout it all. Let's not forget that Megan, for 10 years of her budding career as an actress, was something of a failure. And, and you know, she was kind of uh, 30, over the hill, just about, in Hollywood terms, when she got this gig in Suits. But the fact that she kept on going on, the fact that she went to all these uh, rehearsals and auditions uh, and uh, without the prospect of work um, showed, you know, the, that kind of determination that her father had imbued in her and that has propelled her uh, to where she is today. By 2016, Meghan was an international star with a TV series screened around the world, an army of fans, hundreds of thousands of followers on social media accounts and her own successful lifestyle website. In June that year, to celebrate Father's Day, she posted a touching tribute to her dad on social media. In it, she thanked him for everything he had done for her. But two and a half years on, such messages are a thing of the past. Coming up, how her acceptance into the Windsors sparked a war with the Markles. Prince Harry revealed that it had been a wonderful Christmas and that it had been a chance for Meghan to be with a big family. It's the, it's the family that I suppose she's never had. I remember listening to that comment and thinking, oh, you're going to ruffle some feathers here. That really lit the blue touch paper as far as the rest of her Markle background. Los Angeles. When Meghan was born here in 1981, she was Tom and Dory only child but there were others around too thomas markle he had two children from his previous marriage uh, thomas jr uh, and yvonne who later became known as samantha they lived with their mother to start with after they got divorced and uh, he'd moved to uh, to california and later on they went to live with him and then of course when he got married to doria uh, they became megan's uh, half brother and half sister and at first they all seemed to get on very well and they, they mixed very well and got on well with the neighbors and uh, he had all sorts of parties at home where friends would come around and they all mixed extremely well we were a pretty normal family. Meg was born at the hospital and brought home to our house. We did teach her how to walk. We did carry her around on our shoulders, watch her throw peas all over the kitchen and get blueberries everywhere and, you know, all of the things that babies do and watched her grow. Although all three Markle children got along, there was one significant barrier. When Megan was born, Tom Jr. was 15 and her sister Samantha, 17. 
We were as close as we could be for, for our ages. But were we pals? Did we hang out? No, because I wanted her to have her friends and peer-specific interactions for her development. It wouldn't have been appropriate for the oldest sister to be hanging out. Her friends would have looked at her and said, uh, could you lose the big sister? Can we just <laughs> have girl time? So it, it, it was as natural as it could be age appropriately. By the time Megan reached adulthood, she, Samantha, and Tom Jr. were living separate lives, talking to each other only occasionally, if at all. In her 40s, Samantha was diagnosed with multiple sclerosis and, following a career in broadcasting, became a mature student. The completion of her degree provided the opportunity for a reunion, a touching moment captured in this rare photo of the sisters together. The last time uh, Megan saw uh, Samantha was at Samantha's graduation when she went to university. That was in 2008, so that's 10 years ago. They had sporadic telephone conversation. Tom Jr. went his own way. And by and large, the family just broke up. The Markles may have stopped functioning as a family unit, but their memories of happy earlier days with Meghan remain strong. In 2011, they saw her achieve the acting fame she'd always craved. In 2016, they heard rumors she was dating Prince Harry. And in 2017, they watched as the two announced their engagement. It was just an amazing surprise. It was so sweet. Well, I wasn't surprised. I thought, you know, Meg's beautiful. She's young. She could date any musician, any actor. She wants anybody. In fact, I could barely let you finish proposing. I said, like, can I say yes now? She didn't even let me finish. She said, like, can I say yes? I can I say yes now? And then, then there was hugs, and I had the ring in my finger. And I was like, can I, can I give you the ring? She was, oh, yes, the ring. <laughs> so to me, it's like, let's see where it goes. And good for her. Yes. He's a good person. If he loves her, if this is right, let's see where it goes. At the end of that year, Meghan spent her first Christmas at Sandringham as a guest of the Queen. Days later, Harry went on national radio. Prince Harry revealed that it had been a wonderful Christmas and that it had been a chance for Meghan to be with a big family. Were there family traditions you had to explain to her? Oh, plenty. I think that's probably... I, mean, I think we've brought biggest families that I know of and every family is uh, is, is complex as well so no look she, she's she's done an absolutely amazing job just you know right. getting in there and it's you know it's it's it's, it's, the, it's the family that she, I suppose she's never had the family that she'd never had now I remember listening to that comment and thinking oh you're going to ruffle some feathers here well that really lit the blue touch paper as far as Samantha Tom and the rest of them were concerned because they felt that she had had a family she was trying to ghost the Markles of her life and they felt real resentment that here was this woman trying to deny uh, her Markle background. The first thing I thought was I don't think Carrie's been given the full story. Something's not right. Although we weren't the classic large family together on schedule on ceremony at every holiday, we were family. That's all we could think and then and then the question was why? Like why would you be embarrassed about your family? Why would you need to, you know, set the stage differently? I was starting to feel like, uh, she's not reaching out to family. But could this have been prompted by Samantha herself? Shortly after the engagement announcement, she had made a string of disparaging comments to the media about Meghan. She referred to her sister as a social climber. She described her as narcissistic, said that she'd always wanted to marry a prince, and she had a gingers well the last two not too negative i suppose but you know narcissistic and social climbing just doesn't paint a very positive picture neither did her comments about the rumored seventy-five thousand dollar cost of the dress megan wore in her engagement photo shoot samantha claimed it was excessive given megan's high profile campaigns to lift children out of poverty in the developing world critics accuse samantha of being jealous of her younger sister's success and wealth it's always one of the big issues that causes family feuds. If you and the other less successful brothers and sisters thinking that as their family they should support them during hard times. Samantha always resented the fact that that Meghan didn't pay back to her father the money that that he'd given for her education at Northwestern, which was like seventy thousand dollars a year, and that remember he's been bankrupt, Doria's been bankrupt, Tom Jr.'s been 
bankrupt. Samantha's been bankrupt. So the finances were always an issue inside the Markle family. Nobody ever asked her for financial support. As a principal, you would think, yes, your father's getting older, your sister's in a wheelchair. You, you could have offered. We wouldn't ask. But I know if someone wanted something from me, I would give the shirt off my back. So maybe I assumed too much thinking she would have the same sort of graciousness. But at that point, it wasn't even about us. Here she is on the stage, holding hands with children in countries where people are incredibly poverty stricken and who don't have clean water. And to spend so much on a dress just felt like gross overindulgence. In the midst of this criticism, Meghan had a wedding to plan, but the guest list was causing more family friction. It's a problem that all families face, who is going to be invited and who is not going to be invited. And those that are not invited nearly always feel extremely hurt and annoyed. And the person that's doing the inviting says, there's no way I'm having them at my wedding. With the wedding just weeks away, Meghan and Harry still hadn't revealed their list. By April 2018, Samantha could wait no longer. On social media, she expressed how excited she was at the prospect of being invited. It's, it's fascinating, really. You examine that period and the run-up to the wedding, there was this period where they all felt that they were going to get an invitation and they could all go, and then the invitations didn't come out, and that is when the dam of venom really burst. I think out of tradition and respect, everybody in the family felt that they should have been included because the eyes of the world were on the family, and therefore, if you weren't invited, it must have been because of some fault of your own, or you must be awful and not worthy. So the whole family was feeling like it is a public statement. It is a public exclusion. And then we saw strangers invited, it was celebrities whom she didn't even know, and people from the public. That was a slap in the face. It's like, wow, we're not even considered in all of that. And, and we were still trying to rationalize, like, oh, well, let's just respect her. No, no, it's not about just respect her. She should just respect us. These are real people with real feelings. Was quick to respond to the very public snub by way of an open letter to Prince Harry. He claimed the upcoming wedding was the biggest mistake in royal history and even urged Prince Harry to call it off. I thought it was a bit below the belt, and uh, I'm sure he probably regrets doing it, but uh, at that stage, he probably thought he had nothing to lose. He wasn't going to get an invite, so again, it was, it was a question of embarrassing Meghan, and I think that's probably the reason he did it. Although Tom Jr. soon apologised for his letter, Samantha went on the attack. As she once again took to social media, observers were divided on whether Meghan had made the right decision. I don't think uh, Samantha Markle could seriously have been expected an invite to the wedding after what she'd done with her tweets. And clearly, Meghan made a decision fairly early on not to invite her. And if she's not inviting her, it's very difficult then to invite her half-brother. Uh, so I think it was, it was a non-starter. I've always felt that, quite fr that if Meghan had sent invitations to, to uh, Samantha and Tom Jr., we would not be sitting here today. She should have just said, come to my wedding <laughs> and here's a couple of seats at the back shut up and sign a, sign a non-disclosure agreement. They would have uh, been very happy to be very quiet and enjoyed the day. Mama, do you wish to comment about the fact that they saying One family member who was supposed to be there was Meghan's father. After a successful TV career, Thomas Markle was living in quiet retirement in Mexico. His daughter's wedding was less than a month away. But to the surprise of many, she still hadn't introduced him to her future husband. He's talked to my dad a few times, hasn't been able to meet him just yet. They announced their engagement in November. They didn't get married until May, so there was plenty of time for the two of them who'd busied their diaries, you know, going around the country in the UK and doing a mini tour, which is brilliant to go meet the people of Great Britain. Fantastic. But also go and meet your father-in-law. Hi, Mr. Thomas. How are you? According to friends of Meghan, she did offer her father support, but he refused it. Now the media interest was growing, along with the pressure. No one from the palace had told him what to do, or even told him what to expect. He was then stalked by the paparazzi, and there were some very unflattering photographs of him in the media, looking very overweight and very untidy, carrying cartons of beer, and just looking shambolic. And he was very hurt by this. I mean, every time... 
He opened his door, there, there were camera crews there, and he didn't really know what to do. But then, photos of a smarter, better groomed Thomas Markle appeared in the press. They showed him apparently being measured up for a new suit, searching for news about the wedding on the internet, and reading a book about famous British landmarks. I'm just having a look at... ...photographer for more than 20 years. It's just so obvious that all these pictures are set up. Nobody reads a book like that. And the book is beautifully positioned at a 90 degree angle so you can crystal clear see what it says, author's name, the whole lot. This is Mr. Markle in an internet cafe looking at Harry and his daughter on the internet. This computer is facing at an angle that way, but it's strategically turned this way because the photographer wants to get what's on the screen. And also, which is even more ridiculous on this, the photographer is actually in the internet cafe. This is Meghan Markle's dad being fitted for a tuxedo for Harry and Meghan's wedding, allegedly. If this picture wasn't set up, the photographer was very, very lucky because that's the sort of picture that you would get when you go to a model and say, stand there for me and I'll take a picture. Full frontal, full direction, looking straight at the cameraman. It's just a comedy of errors, this setup of pictures. It soon emerged that the photos were staged. Thomas Markle had been working in league with a photo agency, which then reportedly sold them around the world for a six-figure sum. I mean, it was hugely embarrassing for everyone involved. The whole episode would have infuriated Prince Harry. He probably was sympathetic to, to Thomas, you know, on reflection. But for his father-in-law to be engaging with the paparazzo, the paparazzo who he blamed for the death of his mother, who Harry detests, it, it was just the worst thing that Thomas Markle could have done. And, you know, the couple called Thomas afterwards, according to Thomas, um, he hung the phone up on Prince Harry because Prince Harry berated him and said if he hadn't spoken to the press, none of this would have happened. I think Harry said that was very stupid, wasn't it? Um, and I think he felt a complete idiot and he felt a fool and he felt humiliated. And that was sort of the beginning of the end. Meghan's sister, Samantha, has since admitted organising the photo shoot. She says Thomas Markle received... $1,500 for his cooperation, and claims she wasn't motivated by money, but by a wish to improve her father's disheveled media image. I would defend it to this day. I think what the mistake was, was perhaps that, excuse me, the British royal family or that Meghan Harry would not have defended my father, Meg knowing that that's not how he is. They could have come out and said, don't beat up Thomas Markle. Don't do this to him. And Meg should have defended him. And because she didn't, I was, I was, Fuming. This is not right. You have so much power in the position you're in. Speak up. Don't let him be run over by a train, like stand there and do nothing. So I, I thought, no, I'll take control of this. I'll make sure that he's photographed properly. And if the world doesn't like it, that's not my problem. I'm not going to let them destroy my dad. Eight hours later, Thomas Markle said he wouldn't be attending the wedding. He claimed to have suffered a heart attack and was unfit to travel. The royal only found out when it appeared on the American celebrity website, TMZ. It was like a bomb dropping. That was not the way it should have been happening at all. So I think, you know, the Palace lost their grasp on the narrative. Yeah, there's no doubt that the Palace, Kensington Palace, completely lost control of the situation. That's the one thing they don't like. And Prince Harry is a bit of a control freak himself. And he would have hated the fact that they did lose control. And he lost control as well. As Kensington Palace called on the media to show respect and understanding to Meghan's father, the couple were once again criticised for not visiting him. I definitely think they should have gone to see him promptly. Could they have postponed the wedding? Maybe not, but I would think that after the wedding that Meg and Harry would have gone to the hospital at a minimal and then taken him to Buckingham Palace after he recovered. But, you know, she didn't show up. Those close to Meghan have since said that she and Harry tried to bring her father to London for the wedding, even after the stay photos were published. Once she heard about the heart attack, they say she called and texted him constantly, but he failed to respond. Thomas Markle's absence meant there would be just one member of Meghan's family at St George's Chapel, Windsor, for her fairy tale marriage to a British prince. Next, once the wedding was out of the way, how this speech reopened the family wounds. My earnings from a job on campus went directly towards my tuition. I saw that, and the first thing I thought was, oh, 
my God. What did she just say? Tradition is at the heart of the royal family. And for hundreds of years, choosing a partner was no exception. In previous centuries, royals always married royals. So they would look for a suitable princess from a European house. And it's really only in this century that the royal family have married out, if you like, and married what we call commoners. The ability to marry outside the blue blood ranks has given the royals the same freedom as others, but also the same problems. And in recent times, none have been as problematic as the Markles. According to Meghan's friends, she was not close to half-sister Samantha or half-brother Tom Jr. And neither were a part of her life before she met Harry. The problem for Meghan has been that the Markles aren't prepared to cut her loose the way that she has cut them loose. And unfortunately for Meghan, they show no signs of going away. Most focus social media posts and media interviews, often in exchange for money. Let's face it, you know, we all have to survive. Money makes the world go round. So if you want to call that cashing in, that's fine. But no one in media would refuse a check for talking about the royals. Samantha now has the status of a, an official pest. From the word go, she's been very critical of Meghan. Meghan's half-brother, Tom Jr., has also given a string of interviews, but not all his media appearances have been by choice. Tom Markle Jr. is a bit of a lost soul, to be honest with you. He's been married before to Tracy Dooley. He's got two children, but he doesn't have contact with his sons, certainly doesn't have contact with Tracy, and is in a fairly tumultuous relationship with a girl called Darlene. Tom's problem is that he lives in Grants Pass, Oregon, which is a small town, and he goes to the local bars and drinks one beer too many. And I think he's ended up in county jail a couple of times. There have been all kinds of fights, used when drink has been taken. It is not the behavior that you would expect of uh, uh, someone who is uh, related now to the Queen. While some family members have struggled with the media spotlight, others have tried turn it to their advantage. They include Meghan's nephew, Tyler, son of Tom Jr. You know, he runs a marijuana farm out in America. He's cashing in on it in any way he can. My name is Tyler Dooley. Back in the States, I live on a farm. I cultivate marijuana. You know, his product is called the Markle Sparkle. The family are cashing in both on their notoriety and becoming more notorious. Despite the absence an invitation to the royal wedding, Tyler still made his way to London for the big day. Other family members, including mum Tracy Dooley and his brother, also made the transatlantic trip. That must have been really embarrassing. It just turned the whole thing into a farce. I've got to say, this is probably the biggest circus that I've ever come across. They didn't manage to, to spoil or infringe on Meghan and Harry's day, but, you know, there were salacious headlines nonetheless involving Tyler rocking up at a nightclub and not being allowed in because he was carrying a knife. You know, again, these sort of negative headlines that just seem to be part of the Markle debacle and just will not leave Meghan alone. And you couldn't make it up. For Meghan's sister, media coverage of the impromptu visit by a few relatives led to the entire family being tarred unfairly. They were fringe family members taking advantage of a situation. I, I, they had never interacted in any of our family events or come to holidays or Thanksgiving or gone to Doria's house or her mom. They weren't part of the, the family. So, you know, it's all of a sudden there's this, we're close. You know, we're no, we're not. We've never been. Despite the controversy that surrounded her big day, Meghan managed to put the stresses behind her. At one point, the whole wedding was becoming in danger of being the Markle show, a kind of a, a great, grotesque pantomime where this family just made fools of themselves and made fools of the royal family and especially made a fool of Meghan. And yet, all that kind of evaporated the moment you saw Meghan make her way on her own in St George's Chapel. It was all relevant to what we'd all invested in, the union of a prince with a young woman from nowhere who was going to become a duchess. With the wedding and honeymoon over, Meghan began her new life as the duchess 
of Sussex. In October 2018, she and Harry made their first official trip, a 16-day tour of Australia and the South Pacific Islands. We saw them traveling the globe, intense timetable and schedule that they were sticking to, more walkabouts that were considered a triumph as far as Meghan was concerned, showing her warmth, showing her popularity, and then, of course, the baby announcement. It went through the roof, and we had Meghan Mania Mark II. For a while at least, Meghan's family troubles seemed behind her. But then, a speech to students on the island of Fiji reignited it. As a university graduate, I know the personal feeling of pride and excitement that comes with attending university. She wrote her own speeches, and one of which was on education. And she talked about how she got grants, she'd worked uh, herself in order to pay the fees to go to college. It was through scholarships, financial aid programs, and work study, where my earnings from a job on campus went directly towards my tuition, that I was able to attend university. Not one mention, of course, about her father, who had also stumped up a considerable amount of cash to send her to university. And without question, it was worth every effort. I saw that, and the first thing I thought was, oh, my God, what did she just say? Samantha gave uh, Megan it with all barrels when it came to the fact that her father uh, was mentioned in this speech in a series of tweets samantha attacked megan and her speech she said any money she earned during college would have been for parties and shoes rather than tuition i do think that samantha markle has got a point but she's just so unpleasant i don't see why she feels she's gaining ground by being so unpleasant and telling us things that possibly are true but we don't really need to know them the bottom line is because you're prestigious you can't get away with just treating people how you want. And, and there's no, nobody can tell me through university graduation, not a check missed, his signature on all of them. Every second of the way was because of my dad. And that she knowingly, now this is, you know, there's no senility involved. This is not a memory lapse. This was blatant disregard and um, disrespect and, and cruelty. As 2018 drew to a close, relations between Meghan and her family seemed to have hit rock bottom, but they were about to deteriorate further. Coming up, Samantha responds for the first time to the letter that's plunged the Markles into fresh crisis. Broken heart? She doesn't have a heart. Ever since Meghan's engagement, there's been no let-up in the feud that's engulfed her own family. Along with the attacks from her half-sister and brother, her father has given a series of damaging interviews. He was quite scathing about the royal family. He said they were like the Stepford Wives. He said they were like a cult. And he said they were a bit like a Monty Python sketch. And uh, he said that the Queen would meet Donald Trump, and yet uh, Harry wouldn't meet him. So he clearly was getting quite hurt. And he is deeply hurt. And uh, those sort of comments, of course, uh, you know, come from the heart, but uh, they're not going to help the relationship. Thomas Markle later apologised for his comments and went on TV with an emotional appeal to his daughter. What is your message to her and to Prince Harry if they're watching? Well, I love you very much. You're my daughter, and I'd really like to hear from you. I just keep asking uh, to re respond back to me. Um, and I haven't got any response back. But as a group of Meghan's friends claimed in February 2019, she had responded in a letter she sent six months earlier. We saw revealing private correspondence between Meghan and her father. She had written to him a letter saying, you know, please, can we move on? Can you stop victimizing me and, you know, stop going to the press and so on, which, of course, we know he's got form for doing. Thomas Markle has since gone to the press again this time to reveal extracts of the five-page letter. In it, Meghan said she did support him financially. She also accused him of exploiting her relationship with Harry and of fabricating stories. He branded the letter as hateful. That letter was strategic. It was so elegantly written and contrived. She was basically saying that, you know, my dad had been a liar, that I was a liar. Meghan claimed that Thomas hadn't reached out to her in any way since the wedding. He has text messages on his phone galore. 
she was not contacting him. So it doesn't matter what her letter says. Megan criticized Thomas for reading the tabloid stories about her and believing what she branded as lies. She claimed many of these lies were manufactured by Samantha, who she said she barely knows. There are a lifespan of pictures and experiences together, so maybe it's convenient for her that in her mind she doesn't know us because she doesn't want to because she wants center stage as being a self-made woman. She accused her father of doing nothing as Samantha spread false stories about her. I wasn't maliciously lying. I was pointing out what the world was already seeing. I pointed out that humanitarians don't treat their father coldly. Was that a lie? No, because the world watched it happen to my dad and the world watched her do it. Megan's friends dispute this, saying she personifies elegance, grace, and philanthropy. She claimed her father's behavior had left her with a broken heart. She doesn't have a heart, or she would have been doing everything she could to make him comfortable and reciprocate and be loving and gracious and make sure he's comfortable in his old age. So broken heart? No, his heart's broken. She can't turn herself into the victim here. When contacted about the content of this program and the statements made by Samantha Markle, Kensington Palace declined to provide a comment. The continuing feud within Meghan's family is potentially damaging to her new one. Along with the other members of the so-called Fab Four, she's come to represent the modern face of the royals. They have an image to protect, an image guarded by one woman in particular. The Queen has seen her own fair share of scandals within her own family. So the whole situation with the Markles is, is not going to have her sort of turning away in disgust, but it's not the image the royal family want to have. And she realizes that it does have the potential to negatively impact on the couple. And what's not to say that Thomas won't turn up at an official engagement? If that's the only way he feels he's gonna be able to get through to his daughter, if he's well enough to do it, it's something he might well consider doing. You know, and that's when it's going to cause potential embarrassment for the royal family. And the Queen will not want any more embarrassment when it comes to the Markles. With all due respect, you know, I can't say how she sees things or, or whether or not she feels she should intervene, but she certainly is the matriarch of Great Britain and of the British royal family. She might want Harry to handle this on his own, being the man, and he should. Um, because if it's embarrassing to the British royal family, it's more embarrassing to us. If the Queen can't bring peace to the warring Markles, the arrival of Meghan and Harry's first child just might. When a family has a new baby, it's, you want your baby to know their grandparents. So even if you are a stranger, you don't get on with your parents, that is the moment when you know that that grandparent-grandchild relationship ought to be given a chance to thrive. Prince Charles has developed a close bond with his three grandchildren. With the fourth due in April, it'll be Meghan's decision whether to allow another grandfather into his or her life. The baby has a grandfather who he or she is in danger of never meeting, and if there's any chance of reconciliation there, I think all parties should be trying to grasp it. While family feuds are nothing new, none have been as public as this one. With the eyes of the world on her and her family, will Meghan ever be able to mend her relationship with her father? If she doesn't reach out to her father when she's had her baby, that relationship will never be repaired, will never resume. Under a sensible scenario, Meghan would have the, her first child. At some point, her father would come and see the baby, see Meghan and for the first time, meet Harry, and then go on his merry way back to Mexico. That's the sensible solution. But as we've discussed, there's nothing sensible about the House of Markle when it meets the House of Windsor. One dynasty that has ruled over our great nation for over 1,200 years. But for all the pomp, circumstance, and ceremony, never has one family been so committed to slipping up, saying the wrong things, Mummy, 
and generally making jesters of themselves. Dig that crazy rhythm. So we're delving deep into the Royal Archives to dig out the funniest, <laughs> cringiest, and most embarrassing clips guaranteed to make them sweat, even those incapable of doing so. So, God save the Queen. And all the other royals, for that matter. Who the hell wrote this script? Please be upstanding for the arrival of royal family cock-ups. As the old proverb goes, never work with animals, children, or the Duchess of York. But let's for now focus on when animals break royal protocol. Polo, the world's oldest and poshest team sport and a favourite among royals. I think probably Harry, I would say, is the better sportsman, particularly on the polo pitch. I've never played polo, uh, despite appearances, but, like, the, the thing about this, and this just summarises polo to me, if you're rich enough to have ridden a horse, you can probably just get in the team. Prince Harry here, having a mare, on a mare. On the side, now leaves it open. For the man you don't want to leave it open to. It's time now. He's literally just missed the ball and fallen off the horse. Always very hard to style something out while wearing jodhpurs, I've found. Harry was never the most gifted polo player on earth. I mean... For the man you don't want to leave it open to. It's time now. There's Princess Anne running amok on Margate Beach, one of the first royals to combine horse riding and long jump. Go on, girl, you ride that horse. I've been on a donkey before. She is a really, really good rider, isn't she? She really is. Wasn't she an Olympian? That's it, girl. <laughs> oh! 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 She really, really hit the floor there, like with a lot of. A lot of impact. <laughs> <laughs> At most respect for the horse. <laughs> Doesn't she fall well like a real professional? <laughs> oh, and half don't flinch and continue to take photos. Very professional. <laughs> they go to her like it's an afterthought. <laughs> Naff off, naff off. I know you care more about that damn horse than you do me. Go on, off you go. Oh, it's too late now. Naff off. You know what's incredibly unhelpful? If you fell off a horse and people just come around you and just hold your arm, <laughs> that'll help. Just hold the arm. That'll help her overcome the huge spinal trauma she just suffered by falling off a moving animal. She's a game girl. She just gets up, dusts herself off, and continues with it as if nothing happened. No fuss. While we're discussing Anne's falling prowess, I must point out that she also struggles to stay upright on two feet, let alone four. <laughs> an embarrassing banana skin slip up for Anne there. I give her an eight for execution, but only a five for the landing. Princess Anne isn't the only expert royal rider. Prince Philip has always had a huge passion for carriage driving. The Duke of Edinburgh was very sportive. He was a great equestrian. He was a great polo player. He still does carriage driving. I know because he drives with friends of mine. Here he is talking to his horses with his usual tact and grace. didn't take too kindly to being called an idiot. Oh. Oh. Could be worse, he could be driving a Range Rover. Just a small bump in the road there, Your Royal Highness. That is so scary. That horse has since been chosen in the town of London. Remember the time when the Queen traded in all her corgis for an elephant? Those were the days. Far less barking and easier to feed, though it did insist on sleeping at the end of the bed. 
So sweet. Maybe the elephant thinks it's auditioning for Oliver. Please, ma'am, can I have some more? It was also the first time in recent memory that Prince Charles didn't have the largest ears in the family. <laughs> some elephant saliva there. Which is actually how I retain my boyish good looks. It's not only elegant elephants and huge horses that cause a royal stir. They've had issue with all creatures, great and small. Which William and I draw inspiration from every really got me. <laughs> Mary, Megan, and those pesky bees will disappear, Harry thought. Not so, I'm afraid, sir. Harry hasn't had such a buzz around him since his last Vegas trip. How do you get rid of bees? Interpretive dance. That's an old army technique. Here's the queen of the premiere of The Fast and the Furious Tokyo Drift. But this little pony got a right royal telling off when he tried to munch on her marigolds. <laughs> A little horse is what you get if you shout at Shetlands. No way. <laughs> Wherever the Queen goes, she's accompanied by her corgis. Handily, she can stow them in the overhead compartments when they're being stubborn. Prince Philip was always bewildered why the Queen had so many corgis. In my day, we had nine. And very often, Prince Philip was trying to get from his room into the Queen's room, with all the corgis barring his way. He'd be pushing the door open and swearing at the same time, saying, I don't know why you have so many corgis. To which the Queen would look over her glasses and say, but darling, that's so collectible. You know, we had a saying at Buckingham Palace, horses, dogs, husband and kids. And that was the pecking order. And then Camilla. Young Prince Edward more than happy to take matters into his own hands. The Queen isn't the only lady who lives in a castle and loves dogs. Oh, Mickey, come on. Oh, yes, I love you. Oh, yes. Best love in the world is Matty's love for baby and baby love for Matty. But come on, you need to go back. Here are William and Harry getting fitted for scarves on their first day at Eton. Lovely old tradition. <laughs> Harry thinks this is hysterical. <laughs> When we were in Africa in 2010, I remember being at a conservation park with them and that there was a photo opportunity for them to have a, a huge python round their necks. I think it was Harry who had the head and you know, he was sort of pointing it at William. You could see William just sort of like, you know, well, careful, brother. <laughs> they made for beautiful pictures. <laughs> Here was Team Wales playing up and really, really giving great press. Spiky, with distinctive features and known to form mating trains during breeding season, Harry is one of the most popular members of the royal family. Here he is with an echidna. Next up, we look at how the royal family deal with children. And we have a look at some embarrassing dancing. Excruciating, though. Excruciating. to Royal Family Cock-Ups, a borderline treasonous look at the highs and lows of life as part of the, the younger generation and their on-camera mishaps. Good job, kids, don't embarrass easy. A classic clip of Prince Harry cementing his relationship with the world's media. The royal children are naughty sometimes. I love that when they get caught on camera because it's just so natural. You know, they haven't learned to behave a certain way. They're just children being children, and it's quite sweet that they're allowed to be as well. I think Prince Harry's, I mean, hilarious here, the way he deals with the, the press. Look at that. Look at that, his little cheeky chaffy. He was an adorable little boy, naturally loving and very jovial. Harry was never calmed down. Harry was just left to be Harry. But both boys inherited their mother's sense of humor. I have no doubt about that. It's a pity that he wasn't reined in more and given discipline, because he had a wonderfully natural personality that, with the right amount of discipline, would have behooved him well throughout life. But kids will always be kids and will do as they please, even when on duty. I think the kids are just normal kids. They're not always very to photographers, but good for them. They are just normal kids who haven't necessarily learned the royal protocol yet. It's not just the sticky tongue out insult that Charlotte sends the press. She also throws shade with her words, too. 
<laughs> she really has perfected her death stare. Now for a little royal inside knowledge. When the rulers come out to the balcony at Buckingham Palace, the balustrade isn't that high, but the little ones can't see over it. So little crates are placed on the other side for the littlies to stand on so that they can wave too. I think the royals need to upgrade their health and safety standards, Paul. Oh, child. Case in point. Wills is completely distracted, plotting his payback for Harry's snake prank. At least the Queen bothered to glance. Princess Charlotte here again, this time in Germany for an official visit, asking for something trifling like 15 white ponies, the mummy saying no. Oh yeah, that's it, go for the tantrum. Cos you're wrong, it don't mean you don't get... You dash yourself on that floor. Yeah, you pick her up and try and contain it. Takes me back to where my children were that age. And yes, yes, children do throw tantrums and good mothers don't put up with it. No matter how... Look. I'd give them a look and they'd, they'd get back right up again. When it comes to the discipline, you better know yourself. Sometimes royal etiquette goes completely out the window, like when Savannah takes matters into her own hands when her young cousin George won't shut up. But it's not always playtime for the royal kids. George leaving a commoner hanging. His ancestors would be so proud. Prince William, however, loves talking to strangers. He even offers them kisses. But despite being an heir to the throne, not everyone wants to be his princess. Let's see that again in slow motion. William is rejected hard. Imagine what it must feel like to reject a kiss from the future King of England. But let's find out. It's funny and embarrassing at the same time. Cause it's funny that I did it, but it's like embarrassing that I wanted to kiss him. She had been looking forward to it all day and she obviously just got stage fright and she got all embarrassed and just hid inside my neck and would not turn back around again to speak to anybody. She was all over Sky News before we even managed to get home and I was getting phone calls from friends that I've got. Canada, Australia, New Zealand. And I like saw him again. I think I wouldn't ask for a kiss, I'd just see if he remembered me. And it's going to be great for when she's 18 and 21 and has a big birthday party and we can pull all the photographs out and have them all over the wall and remind her about it. Yeah, I can always look back and, and like, just be like, well, I rejected Prince William. In an argument, anyone brings anything up about me, I can just say that to them. Prince William's awkwardness continues in this world exclusive, never before seen footage of him being royally embarrassed at an American theme park in 1993. I'm pretty sure with this clip, HRH stands for His Royal Humiliation. We've all been there, having a lovely time enjoying the after-dinner entertainment, when suddenly you're picked to be part of the show. Mortifying. I don't think looking at your feet is going to get you out of this one, William. To humiliate him further, they've now provided an oversized waistcoat and cowboy hat. Maybe no one will recognise you as the future King of England. To make matters worse, a cheeky kiss and an attempt at an American accent. Such a flirt. A forced wave to mummy now, just what every 11-year-old boy wants to do in public. Finally, a bow to end the indignity, although slightly rushed for some so experienced. I wonder where that certificate is hanging now. Perhaps on the next scene stealer steals the scene more than any scene stealer before him. How sweet is that little boy? He's like, ah! Her sweet, cheeky, utterly toothless, gaffy, smiling page boy and Brian Mulroney um, stealing the scene absolutely unwittingly. I think he captured the joy and the mood of the nation. Or maybe he'd just be looking at Pippa's bottom. Oh, God. Oh, now you're just being mean. See, that's why he should have been with me. Do you know what I mean? I mean, him could have... Kits and banter. Sorry, Megan. Anytime. 
This children's choir not only sing to entertain Her Majesty, they also perform their own stunts. Don't worry, no children were hurt in the making of this programme. Here's a young lady dressed in her best traditional Welsh attire to impress Her Majesty. Textbook curtsy. And um, put, put your skirt down, babe. My mother always said, don't stand too close to soldiers. Oh, oh, oh. No way. You have to play it again. Did I see what I think? Did she just get it? <laughs> Look at that. She just got absolutely. She won't be doing that again, will she? I met the Queen and then I got pumped up. As a near professional dancer myself, I recognize the need to express yourself. However, there's nothing like a royal dance move to make you want to cringe yourself inside out. Don't believe me? Have a look. How many times have you seen the future King of England thrusting in a post office queue? Well, you're in luck, because here's Charles auditioning for part in the full Monty. Oh, no. No. Come on, Charlie, that's the half Monty. Bit more oomph, please. <laughs> it's the hip thing, isn't it? I mean, imagine making him do a... <laughs> the lady in green is seconds away from overpowering his security and joining in. <laughs> you could see it too... Sadly, Prince Charles never took to the stage with the full Monty, perhaps for good reason. Stripping clearly wasn't his thing, so maybe he thought breakdancing would be more his style. Oh, no, don't do this. Oh! Charles, Prince. <laughs> Is he going to copy what they did? Oh. As an awkwardly positioned white guy, what posh white guy, I can't really sort of criticize another awkwardly positioned posh white guy trying to dance. But I'll say it anyway, he looks very awkward. Not as awkward as Charles's aides, whose rigid stances and fixed smiles are hiding a multitude of faults. I drop my ratchet ass down to the, down to the floor. Oh, he's on the floor. No, he's gonna limbo. Don't limbo, babes. <laughs> it's almost too cringe to watch. What was he thinking? Give him life. <laughs> so deeply unsexy. What a sport. He's such a good sport. Not sure what he was trying to do. I mean, really? Prince Charles? Break dancing? No, we don't need that. We really don't need that. And just three short years later, he was a fully paid-up member of Run DMC. Third time's the charm for our dancing king with a bit of Latin flair at the Rio Carnival in Brazil. I'm sure that smile has nothing to do with the semi-naked beautiful women dancing with him. What? That's his favourite move! He's really going for it in this clip, much more so. Maybe because there's a lady involved. He's, you know, he's had a few... Glasses of Bollinger, I don't know what they drink, gold, something like that. And, and he's, just, he's just going for it, and, and, and it's, it's lovely to see. This is a different Charles to when we saw him trying to do the little hip-hop. He was a little bit like, oh, no, 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 no. This one, he was like, yes, I don't care, the camera's head. It's the sweat-out hair bit, that bit. You know someone's having a good time when his hair, which is usually, you know, in a nice position, just dangles down. <laughs> While we're talking awkward Charles moments, no amount of dreadful overacting can disguise the excruciating embarrassment he's causing himself while he play fights with an old bag while taking in some rather unsightly sucking and blowing. His fellow actors think he's lost it. 
Right, more royal cock-ups still to come, including these famous faux pas. So disrespectful. Welcome back to Royal Family Cock-Ups. So far, we've had slips, trips, and thrusts. And that's just the first two parts. Next on the dance floor is Prince Harry, proving he's got just as much rhythm as his father. <laughs> this, for me, is the epitome of Prince Harry. You know, don't really know what I'm doing, but I'll just do it anyway with a smile. You know, and just kind of, am I leaving the kids? Are the kids leaving me? I don't know, but I'll just do it anyway. That girl behind Harry is all of us. Watching on, hands on head, barely able to look. Now, this isn't technically a cock-up, but if you had to show an alien one clip that represented Britishness, this next one would be a good place to start. Toffs in differing uniforms, bobbing up and down in the rain in a perspex box. There's Charles keeping relatively good time tapping his sword. Camilla is certainly giving it her all, bopping up and down. The Queen is quite rightly choosing a more demure approach. Really going for it. Why is this so cute? Like, it's so sweet. The Queen, Prince Philip, the Prince of Wales, and the Duchess of Cornwall having a little jig a, to a sea shanty. <laughs> it's fabulous, and they're all sort of bob. They're all having a very good time, very toe tapping. William and Catherine don't strike me as the most agile movers in the firm. Mind you, this footage from Tuvalu in 2012 might prove me wrong. I really love this footage. This is quite early on in the marriage, and, you know, I don't think many people have gotten to see that fun side to the Duchess. Oh, I love this. She's just so natural, isn't she? I was a bit embarrassed at the start. Now oh, I'm getting really into it. She's having a great time. This has the, the energy of, like, um, a couple on a gap year, and they've had some wacky backy or magic mushrooms, and she's like, yeah, I'm feeling really quite good. Yeah, why is everything so funny? <laughs> Has anyone got any bread? I'm really hungry. You can see that the atmosphere there is really, really something. Everybody's on a kind of natural high. Are you sure it's a natural high, Deborah? Maybe I'm not sure about that, actually, now I'm looking at William. Oh, my gosh. Whoa, he's a bit of a groover, actually. <laughs> That's also... Will's gay. Will actually can dance, as you can see in that clip. He's like, I'm having the time of my life, and I don't care who knows it. Yeah, has anyone got that bread you asked for? He might be able to dance, Josh, but it looks like he took style advice from Paul Burrell. I think people love to see the Raws having a good time. And as you can see from that clip, Clearly, William and Kate threw themselves into it and had a great time. There's something about this scene that makes me think of that pagan horror film, Midsummer. Hmm. But the royally born aren't the only ones forced into awkward dancing situations. It's Camilla's turn to bust a move on the dance floor. Or cafeteria, in this case. Oh, my gosh, the things that I have to do. This is why I didn't want to be in the royal family. Oh, gosh. And all the time I've got to smile and think of England. Like, her mind's saying, come on, left, left, no, daddy, this is right. Nobody going in a circle. Right, left, or circle. Two of them are what? No, I just... <laughs> a group number on Strictly, this isn't. Charles is going to pay for this. Just think of the throne. You're going to be queen. Queen Camilla. Queen Camilla. Queen Camilla. Queen Camilla. Queen Camilla. Camilla. The firm, leaving the sanctuary of their castles and forced to interact with the general public while on tour, can lead to some right royal cock-ups. A royal visit to the recording of The Voice Canada now. I now introduce the throat singer. He's looking at her like she's on another planet. 
performing the ancient Inuit art of throat singing. These tours are quite intense, that you cannot be on guard all the time. Sometimes the mask slips. And I think it's when the mask slips that you get um, probably the most fun moments of the tour. It is nice for the royals every now and then to break through that barrier and to give us a peep at their humour. Because, after all, they are human. It's very intimate, isn't it? <laughs> She's going, I can't. Charles, I... He's going, what's the matter with you? She's going, I just don't stop it. Don't stop it. <laughs> I'm not sure Camilla would spin her chair for this performance, although maybe it would be helpful if she did. She's pulled out her glasses. Rich Charles is like, get it to go. <laughs> She's actually really struggling there. <laughs> Oh, no, that's really too much. <laughs> He's handling this better than me. <laughs> <laughs> She's lost it. You know, it's acknowledged as one of the most complex human vocalisations. Whether Camilla appreciates it or not, it's art. That's what we need to remember. <laughs> Just thank God Philip's not there. <laughs> You know, there are times when it's funny because it's not funny. And, but equally, you're supposed to find it funny, so you do find it funny because it's not funny. Are you talking about the singing or this show? We're very honoured to have the Majesty of the Queen with us today. Who said the Queen wasn't relatable? There's nothing. Script's in hand. She's ready to go. Oh, dear. At least she saw the funny side. She kept calm and carried on. When meeting the Queen, it can be a minefield of protocol and etiquette, so if you're going to do it, you require intelligence and a sense of decorum. Ah, here's Katie Nichol to remind us of the royal etiquette when walking with Her Majesty. You will always see the Queen go first, and that is incredibly important. No one goes before the Queen. Remember that? Donald Trump? I'm sure even he can understand those simple instructions. Can't he? La, 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 la. I'm bigly phenomenal. I'm so great, look at me walking along. I'm walking. I actually invented walking. Not a lot of people know that. I invented walking and pointing like a child. I'm so bigly great. Fake news, fake news. Well, normally it's ladies first, but I don't trust you bringing up the rear. Get out the way, you pillock. Look at their fluffy hats. I like them. Oh, for God's sake, you've been briefed, you idiot. He's not even thinking about where is she. She's so tiny, but it's like, know your place! I need to do a, a um, voiceover of that with a patchwork. Where's my white Where are my white Romy You know what I'm saying? I'm the queen, yeah, white Romy. Mr. Move! Move him! Damn idiot. Yeah, that's not funny. Mm. Yeah, that's not funny. Mm. Yeah, that's not funny. Yeah, that's not funny. Yeah, that's not funny. Yeah, that's not funny. Yeah, from one bumbling presidential buffoon to another. Oh, no, not this prize, Plum. Now what's he going to say? I'd like to thank the Queen of the United Kingdom of States. You helped our nation celebrate its bicentennial in, in 1976. What did he just say? You helped our nation celebrate its bicentennial in, 17, in 1976. <laughs> what a Plum. How dare he add 200 years onto our monarch? I think she's aging beautifully. She gave me a look that only a mother could give a child. When the queen gives you that look, you are immediately in check. I mean, it's a look which requires no words whatsoever. No prizes for guessing who gets the very same look across the family dining table. After an encounter with that ambling American, a state dinner in the company of Canada's hunky Prime Minister, Justin Trudeau, would have come as a more palatable prospect. Although, in a pre-dinner speech, Mr. Trudeau reminded the Queen that he was the 12th Prime Minister of Canada during her reign. 
thank you, Mr. Prime Minister of Canada, for making me feel so old. <laughs> and she has dancing eyes. Just look at those eyes. They dance with delight. They dance with life. You can see she's looking to have a good time. She's looking to get the best out of any situation. And the Queen isn't the only royal keen to put Mr. Trudeau in his place. High fives are so 90s. It's all about the fist bump now, JT. Look at that, Justin Trudeau trying to, trying to win over Prince George, but he's having none of it. I'm so glad to see that Prince George already displays impeccable taste and judgment. As the Cambridges prepare to depart, you can just about see Justin gritting his teeth, knowing he's been royally upstaged by Sprog. There's nothing you can do. You know, this is a little child who doesn't want to play ball. He will make a very good king. If this is how he's starting out, long may he continue on that path. Meghan quickly realised that living life in the fast lane and being part of the firm has its thrills and spills. <laughs> she hasn't been that shocked by something going off unexpectedly since their wedding night. Princess Diana here on her theme park day out with her two boys. This particular clip is a favourite of mine because I was there. I was on the next log coming down the flume. When you see the princess come down first, she turns the corner, she looks up and she says to the boys, Look, they're coming down now. And there was me and my two boys in the next log getting drenched. She loved every second of that. Di's having a whale of a time, but I think the boys are turning a grey-green colour. I think, you know, this, this was pure Diana. This wasn't Princess of Wales. This was Diana as a mother. I mean, you could just see the joy in her face, the, you know, the tears of laughter, the kids absolutely loving it. This is a perfect example of Diana wanting her boys to have a normal life. And this is her being, being a mum rather than a future queen. It's actually some of my favourite footage of, of Diana. It really shows her as the fabulous mother and the fun-loving person that she was. Di hadn't had this much fun since she witnessed Charles attempting to break dance. <laughs> to Heathrow now in 1985, when Princess Diana was invited to watch a demonstration of the airport's drug sniffer dogs at work. It's a very determined dog. Amazing how he found Harry's bag so quickly. The dog's just thinking, give me the fix, give me the fix, give me the fix, give me the fix. <laughs> oh, I, I think maybe it's put a little bit too much drugs in the case. Dog drug addiction is a sad reality that's not spoken about enough. Princess Diana nervously looking on. Could be anybody's bag. <laughs> oh, gets the heroin out. Hmm, what sort of a party is this? This is like a classic 90s news clip, the sort of moral panic around heroin and drugs. And a little Cirque du Soleil just to finish off the drugs bust. Oscar the drugs dog, very good at finding heroin, but unfortunately addicted to it. People won't realise that for an engagement like that, weeks of planning go into it. Um, but you cannot prepare for the unexpected. <laughs> the princess is just in fits of giggles and eventually is escorted away from... Engagement, but you know, she will she will have laughed about that for a long time afterwards. Oscar the heroin dog was going to be assisted by the cannabis corgi, but unfortunately he was in the next room having a mellow sesh and chomping on protein-based treats. This is so sad. The dog is addicted. It's addicted. It was fully invested in taking home the drugs. And that is that for part three. Time to go for a royal wee. Oh, no. Join us after the break for more Royal Family Cock-Ups. <laughs> Welcome back to Royal Family Cock-Ups. A look at the Royal Family as narrated by me, Giles Brandreth. And sadly, not the...
way round, despite my repeated protestations. It's not just us average Joes who go weak at the knees at the thought of catching a glimpse of the crown jewels. Even global superstars want a piece of the royal pie. Those offended by a public flouting of royal etiquette rules should look away now. This is probably the most famous clip of breaching royal protocol. <laughs> <laughs> oh, God, it's so cringe, isn't it? <laughs> That was the last time anyone saw Posh smile. Charles hasn't been publicly embarrassed like this since he last tried break dancing. A kiss on the cheek, perhaps, but a pinch on the bottom, a bit too far. If at first you don't succeed, try again. It's just not the way that you treat people, is it? And just watch the PPO's face as the Prince of Wales' bum is being pinched. He didn't enjoy that at all, did he? Perhaps a little bit too close to the royal personage, or maybe the crown jewels. Typically in history, if you pinched the royal cheeks, you'd be hanged, drawn and quartered, which was also the name of the girl band at the time. To Jamaica now, where the world's fastest man has a royal showdown with Eton's fastest ginger. This doesn't seem fair. <laughs> Poor Usain Bolt. He fell for the oldest trick in the book. <laughs> Wouldn't be the first time he's faced a cheat, though, would it? <laughs> 9.58 seconds is also roughly how long Prince Harry would last in the Jamaican sun. As a royal, it's almost second nature to end up in embarrassing situations. Take this, for example. Bon Jovi. Taylor Swift and Prince William indulging in the weirdest karaoke of all time. Woo, Taylor's up for it, boy. <laughs> Wait, is, is he going to dance? Why do I feel nervous? I don't think I've ever seen a man look as on edge as Prince William does there. Just constantly, oh, I'm doing my time. I'm doing I'm touch my nose and all. Do you think he just feels so uncomfortable? You know that moment when you're sweating on your palms? You can see... Oh, oh. Poor Prince William. I identify. I've been in situations like that. You're just thinking, oh, my God, how can I get this to end quickly and retain at least a little bit of my dignity without making a complete idiot of myself? William just mouthing the words to God save the Queen and hope for the best. So uncomfortable. He did okay in the end. But he should have come to me for little shoulder movements. Would have torn a little bit better than that. The iconic trio of Taylor Swift, Bon Jovi, and Prince William. The bands no one asked for and no one wanted. I'm surprised they didn't change the words to living as an heir. Harder, faster, bolder ginger, when the messiah met the princess. But they've clearly learnt their lesson from past fashion faux pas. They're having none of it. William and Harry can name drop all they want, but they'll never get one up on their grandparents. This is one ultimate power couple meeting another ultimate power couple. At least, Philip's there to show them who's boss, reminding the Obamas that it's rude to have your backs turned to the cameras. Say cheese. No matter the occasion, Philip always succeeds in flustering the females. It's the Duke himself who decided that they should spend the actual day of their anniversary on Malta for this very private of public couples. Quite a romantic gesture. <laughs> on the occasions where I've met Prince Philip, I have to tell you, I've thought he's just great. He's very witty, he's very funny, he tries to turn every occasion into an occasion that's going to be fun. There was always a witty one-liner, there was always something that would happen that wasn't scripted.
did that often made the Queen laugh, that certainly made us laugh, certainly made the people that Prince Philip was meeting laugh. <laughs> Aha. Now it's time for a check on the weather with the meteorological monarch himself. Long to reign over us, it's Prince Charles. Who the hell wrote this script? Uh, as the afternoon goes on, the best of the drier and brighter weather will, of course, be over the Northern Isles. I think all of the roles have different ways of showing their sense of humour. Some of them a really, like, tight fit. But a cold day everywhere with temperatures of just eight Celsius and a brisk northeasterly wind. Prince Charles has got a little bit more leeway. Um, I think the ones that are coming up are a little bit more nervous um, on how to and when to. Thank God it isn't a bank holiday. <laughs> OK, so we know William likes to sing badly, but can he dance? Thankfully, this was put to the test at the 2017 Royal Variety Show in front of nearly five million viewers. Gallop back off. Is there someone that you wanted to ask to gallop? I don't know, they could do maybe a seated gallop or a standing gallop. I love Miranda. Love Miranda. Is there someone that you wanted to ask? Please, sir, will you gallop with us? The way that William puts his head in his hands, he's probably not expecting this, and he flushes really easily, William. He always colours up really quickly, like his dad. <laughs> Oh, he does! He does gallop! Oh, bless. <laughs> <laughs> oh, God, what have I done? And he can't gallop! Well, how could he possibly say no to that face? To find out more about this unusual royal request, we headed over to Essex to meet the gal who got William to gallop. Hello, sir. It's me, Nicole. Come in our house. This is Nicole Sabibi. I'm 10 years old and I live with my mum, my dad and my two sisters, Alyssa and Amy. I joined an agency at my dance school and then I was asked to audition for Annie the Musical for the role of Molly. Oh my gosh, I got uh, the prince to actually gallop. It was really cool. I think it was like the day before the actual performance. Like, we all, like the people find, finding out that we had lines and stuff. I was just like, oh my gosh, I'm actually going to like to him. Oh, you're so nervous. It's not every day that you get to talk to a royal. I was like practicing it with my friends, making sure I don't mess up my words. Please, sir, will you gallop with us? 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 <laughs> he looked pretty funny doing it. <laughs> So I knew that she was, she had a few lines. I didn't realise she was going to dress the prince. I think she smashed it, she nailed it. Obviously we're very proud, we were very proud parents to, to see her on stage. I don't think he could have said no to me. She does have a very sweet, sweet voice. At the time, I didn't really think it was a big deal. And then everybody kept on saying, oh my gosh, you did what? And then um, I realised just how much a big of a deal that was. It was an achievement, like, oh my gosh, I got uh, the prince to do something. The future king of England. <laughs> yeah, to actually gallop. Hello, Prince William. <laughs> if I did see Prince William again, I would get him to do some funny dance moves, like the robot, or, or maybe the floss even. Please, sir, will you pirouette for me? <laughs> we saw him and Princess Kate coming out and going into their car. We just started going like this, and she waved at us. <laughs> <laughs> when you're a member of the royal family, one thing you're sure to be good at is a right royal opening. Hours are spent pulling on strings and drawing back drapes. But don't be fooled, there's always a cunning cock-up lurking behind the curtain. While the Queen always gives a good tug, the same can't be said for her husband, the Duke of Edinburgh. Pay attention because I'm now going to see the world's most experienced plaque unveiled. <laughs> he was very confident in that line, like, it's a, I'm, I'm, I'm the chief out here. Because I'm now going to see the world's most experienced plaque unveiled. <laughs> <laughs> Done it so often he's doing it badly now. <laughs> How can a man who's unveiled thousands of plaques be this bad at unveiling plaques? This is despite his immodest self-titling. You're about to see the world's most experienced plaque unveiler at work. This has got to be the oldest one-liner that the Duke has.
has always turned to, you know, but then when you're opening plaque after plaque, I mean, how many different things can you think of to say? I'm sure he uses it in all contexts as well. You're about to witness the most experienced ribbon cutter, the most oh, experienced hospital visitor, the most experienced lovemaker. How do we think you'll fare this time? Come on, sir, you've got this. Oh, dear. This bloke isn't helping at us either. <laughs> Cheeky, had a look before you could start. He can't even be trusted when the Queen's around. What was he hoping to find? Let's see if they've passed on their skills to the children. Here's the heir to the world's most experienced plaque on Vela Throne, giving it a go. There's nothing could give me more pleasure than to unveil this plaque. Wondering what on earth it's going to say. <laughs> <laughs> it seems they haven't. <laughs> Poor Prince Charles. <laughs> it doesn't always go to plan, does it? <laughs> oh, I dropped it. What a plunker. He just looks around like he's never picked up anything in his life. Most people's reaction would just to be to go and pick it up, but people have always done that for him, haven't they? <laughs> that is clearly very much entitlement that his father doesn't have. Maybe that's a job for Camilla, then. He's the size of a postage He's the size of a postage stamp. I've never seen a plaque so small. You know, I think I speak for everyone when I say, what a rubbish plaque. Let's give Charlie another go, shall we? <laughs> That's if he can even gain access to the curtain. I've been reliably informed by a person who's not here at the moment, just in case it goes wrong, who yanked on that little plot. Come on. <laughs> Spoke too soon, Father. The priest had always longed to embarrass the prince, and here he very much succeeded. <laughs> Surely the grandchildren have learnt from their elders' mistakes. <laughs> there's every chance that there's no plaque and they're just unveiling a pair of velvet curtains. Although part of me hopes this is a plaque honouring the Chuckle Brothers. To me, to you, to me, no, to you. Who's this? Someone after their 15 minutes of fame by stealing all the limelight? How embarrassing. Come on, Harry. Your family's reputation is riding on this. So I'd like to formally invite you to pull the left hand side and unveil the commemorative plaque of this occasion. And you're on the wrong side. Great start. Not even the spin and glide technique can distract us from that cock up. Kudos to the person who donated their rah rah skirt for the special occasion. Coming up, in the time it takes for William's hair to recede another two inches, Liz and Phil go on the rampage. Welcome back to Royal Family Cock Ups. So far, we've had some bad dancing, dad dancing, and break dancing. I, for one, am excited to see what's next. The royals have been renowned fashion icons through the ages. From their tiaras to their tuxes, they rarely step a foot wrong. But when they do, it ends up on a comedy clip show just like this one. With so many fashion faux pas to choose from, we wanted to bring you a top of the frocks countdown of the worst royal fashion disasters. As read by our very own Josh Berry. It put me out of a job. Straight in at number five, this red carpet howler. The Queen is known for her bold, bright colours, but Princess Anne's fashion choices here seem to have been influenced by her heavy fall earlier on. Shocking. Going down and draining into the bin, this classic is at number four. Whilst the Queen is used to her children being a stain on her good name, for once her soup technique seems to have let her down. No accounting for t no matter how much money you spend on it, it's number three. Princess Diana clearly taking style tips from wimpy waitresses worldwide in this particular get-up. I'm passionate about looking the part and dressing for the part and being dressed appropriately. It's important to wear the right clothes for the right occasion. It's been my life, really. I mean, having dressed the most famous, iconic princess in the world, I think I have quite a reputation to hold up. I certainly hope you didn't dress her on this. 
Asian Paul. Pip to the post to number two, it's this shock frog fright fest. Drawing in an audience of 60 million viewers, there was only one question on everyone's lips at the wedding of William and Kate in 2011. What on earth is that on Princess Beatrice's head? Maybe it's a tribute to the artist formerly known as Prince. No, not Harry, the other one. And still riding high at number one, it's right to the town for this all-time froggy horror show fame. <laughs> Absolutely nowhere by storm. That bright orange duvet slung around her shoulders was the biggest fashion mistake of all time. It looks as if it's about to eat her. It's enormous and inappropriate. A true fashion faux pas fit for our top spot at number one. Yeah, if I'm honest, I don't really think there's any, like, bad moments of fashion that I've seen in the royal family. I've never seen them, you know, turn up in a little bit of stretch jeans. I've never seen the queen turn up in leggings, do you know what I mean? A little night top or a little titty hanging out. No, I've never, I've never seen that from any of them. Sorry, it's the old school Jamaican in me. <laughs> oh. One mustn't forget that without the love and support of the citizens of the world, the royal family would be lost. But that's not to say that their subjects are not subject to the odd cock-up from time to time. Like this gentleman, for example, who is nervously about to introduce Princess Anne for her pre-dinner speech. Welcome, Her Royal Highness, the Prince of Wales, to our... <laughs> I think you mean the Princess Royal, don't you? Welcome. Royal Highness, the Prince of Wales, to our... <laughs> Princess Anne showed her forgiving side as she ordered him to be thrown from only the second floor of Windsor Castle. The actual Prince of Wales now, visiting key workers at a supermarket distribution centre. But the gentleman meeting the future king seems a little overwhelmed by the occasion. This is fabulous, Charles. Hello. We're in, we're in Asda. Is that some sort of waste disposal thing? Are you? Look at this bloke, he, he, he's, he's, this is his moment. All right, oh, he was swinging about a bit. Oh! 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 Typical photographer trying to jump in and get the money shot. She's having none of it. Oh my gosh! Do you think it was made me nervous? <sighs> Prince Charles is well known to have that effect on people, which might explain his somewhat carefree attitude. The best thing I think about this clip is, is how Prince Charles sort of just seems to go, oh, oh dear, a peasant seems to have died, and sort of sees very briefly if he's all right, and then just totally moves on. Oh, he's dead, fine. So what do you do? Yeah, I'm, I'm fine, I'm fine. Get up and get out of the right. Oh, Derek, you've absolutely balls that one up, you idiot. You'll be delighted to know, after dusting himself off, the employee... But fear not, fine sir. Even the professionals fall flat on their face in royal company. He now has a red face to match his jacket. At least hundreds of people don't turn up to watch the changing of the guard every day. The roller skate's addition to the uniform was not well received. I've had a few people fall over and they've, yeah, seen me. They tripped, but that's not the point. Charles isn't the only royal to the public fall head over heels for him. People go weak at the knees when they meet Harry, too. Everywhere I went with Prince Harry when we travelled on tour, you would see Harry mania. You would see girls, women, grandmothers holding up banners. We love you, Harry. And he loved it. <gasps> One Direction moment as well. Oh, no. Oh, that's embarrassing, isn't it? Prince Harry is so humble, given that that's what he's able to do. You know, what he should really be like is, I'm Prince Harry, people actually, like, you know, lose it when they, when they see me and are around me, so, yeah, I'm a pretty big deal. I'm pretty good at giving hugs, I guess. Free hugs for everyone. Hug for you, a handshake for you, maybe a hug. Everyone else is just sort of like, hi, really nice to meet you, this is great. She's oh my God. <laughs> she is shaking. 
I know what you mean, girl, because when I kind of take that when I was younger, I was off, I was off, I was off, girl. It was like a little take that moment, was it? It was like, oh, <laughs> She's completely taken over by the moment, and she's physically shaking after the moment. What is that? Complete adoration of a member of the royal family. Certain members of the public have very extreme reactions because that's their personality. It does not behoove the public figure to forget that it's not about them. You don't drive people crazy. Some people are just more excitable than others. Slight little feeling of jealousy. I knew I should have cried when I nearly saw him. I knew it. I get that a lot too, the sobbing. The Duke of Edinburgh is famously forthcoming with his opinions, even when he visits primary schools. Let's just say, not much of Harry or Will's art would have made it onto the Windsor Fridge. Classic Philip. What can I tell you? That's why I love the Duke of Edinburgh. No mucking around. It's fair to say that Prince Philip... <laughs> As a royal, you have to maintain a stiff upper lip at all times, even when infants are trying to steal your flowers. It will evidently be some years before he learns that you give flowers to a lady, not take them away. The Queen is ever the professional, and she is all forgiving. Really, she's the nicest person you could ever wish to meet. And this little boy broke all royal protocol when he refused to let go of the Queen's hand during a routine handshake. I think the Queen has got a lot of bants. Yeah, she's a little cheeky, but she might give you a little eye just to say, I see you, like proper Queen. One does not look amused. He was later fed to the swans. Do you remember the days when we could shake hands? Like we could actually physically shake hands and say hi. Days are done. The royals are well known to have a good, if not slightly curious, sense of humour. It seems they have a penchant for the peculiar, as highlighted during a special musical performance at Clarence House in 2010. It's a very old instrument, and it consisted of an organ of cats, which was which was <laughs> cats. Ah, uh, yes, uh, exciting. <laughs> It's funny the things that they find funny. The cat organ actually played to Prince Charles's rather strange, goonish sense of humor. <laughs> <laughs> he can't contain himself. <laughs> Most of the royals have a fine sense of the ridiculous. They find silly things funny. Camilla looks lost. Like, is this really funny to you guys? I'm just... Pull yourself together. It's not that bloody funny. Oh, musical Pussycats has always been his favourite. <laughs> we play it at home all the time. Oh. <laughs> I think he's playing like this cat piano or whatever instrument he's called it. I think he's just making the sound like with his mouth. Like that's I mean, how hard can it be? Anyone can do that. Look. Meow, 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 meow. Okay, wait a second. Meow, meow, meow. Wait, I've lost my tone. To prove to you that this gentleman is not in fact making these noises with his mouth as beautifully demonstrated by Judy. Hello, welcome to my studio. If you come in, my name's Henry Dagg, and I'm a musician who composes, performs, and develops new instruments and sound sculptures. And this is what uh, I make do with for the time being as a studio. Occasionally, I need to wheel in the catastrophe for rehearsals. As it happens, this is the 10th anniversary of my performance at Clarence House. About the summer of, of 2010, I'd just been playing at a party with Jules Holland a few weeks later, I got a call from Jules asking if I'd be interested in, in playing at a thing called the Start Festival uh, at Clarence House, organised by Prince Charles. It was a very interesting offer because I, I hadn't uh, ever been approached to do anything like this. It, it just sounded really interesting to do. I was just, just very happy to meet somebody. I raised 
highly, and of course, uh, very, very noticeably, he, um, he asked me to, um, to play the catastrophe. I, I didn't really think it was likely that, that any of my performances would be attended by any members of the royal family. I just, I just knew I was performing in their garden. I was quite amazed when I saw the, the reaction and saw them both wiping tears of, uh, of laughter away. I thought, wow, this is a serious privilege. You know, how many people have, have performed to the royal family and got that reaction? That's, that's, a, that's a little treasure that, that, um, that can never go away. You know, that's, that's a really unique little um, piece of history. I've always admired Prince Charles hugely for his stand on the environment. I've been a, a long-standing fan of his. So if Prince Charles is interested in having a, a reprise performance, I, I'd certainly think about it. Meow. Meow. I'm sorry. Meow. Yeah, well, no. Listen, I've just shown you that anyone could do that. Do you know what I mean? Meow. We're going to try that one again. Meow. Oh, sorry. Coming up. <laughs> intense aristocratic rivalries of the like not seen since Mrs. Brandreth beat Mr. Brandreth in our inaugural family chess boxing tournament. That was a Christmas I'll never forget. <laughs> Welcome back to Royal Family Cockups. 67 years of gaffes and blunders condensed down into just two hours. William and Catherine visited a Cardiff care home where they previously hosted a virtual bingo event. You'd think the residents would be complimentary of the Royal's bingo lingo, but one resident couldn't help let her true feelings be known. I'm not the faces, but we did the bingo with you. Yes. You won. Yes. Yeah. But you said we didn't do a very good job. <laughs> <laughs> that is, that's what I love about old people. It's just a complete, say it how it is, I'm, I'm gone soon anyway. So just, just like. <laughs> Out of the mouth of babes and old people cometh forth wisdom and the truth. But you notice how both William and Catherine roll with the punches and take it in the spirit in which it was intended. Was it that bad? Was it the worst job you've ever seen? <laughs> to see. It's the ultimate breach of royal protocol. You you don't swear in front of the royal. You probably don't tell them they've done a terribly bad job. You lie. Not not this lady who was very forthright in her assessment of, of William and Kate's bingo skills. They encouraged it perhaps a little bit too much. Everybody might start jumping on the bandwagon going, oh, what they really like. <laughs> that they might be in the briefing. Man that rhymes with jam and um, swear as much as you can. <laughs> with the eyes of the world watching their every move, family disputes and animosity can sometimes spill over into public events. The firm is laden with royal rivalries. No more so than the brotherly banter between Princes William and Harry. This is an iconic clip. Classic inter-brother bullying. I think both of us, he's definitely got more brains than me. I think we've established that from school, but when it comes to all that, I... I like William. Hand, I'm much better hands-on. Yeah. When you find solo. Boldness, sorry? When you find solo. <laughs> Ooh, that was below the belt, wasn't it? Boldness. Hand, I'm much better hands on. Yeah. And when you find solo. Boldness, sorry? When you find solo. Harry slipped that one in neatly. Boldness. You feel as though at this stage of his life, Harry has a bit more ammunition against Will. Like, oh, you're bald. Oh. I mean, sadly, Prince Harry now mostly bald. Harry showing he means business today with that cutting comment on William's regrettable receding hairline. Did you just ever dig at the baldness? <laughs> There's what, sorry? Baldness. There's baldness. Yeah, so no. What's that? Yeah. It's pretty rich coming from a ginger, so I'm quite happy to see that. Pretty rich coming from a ginger. It's pretty rich coming from a ginger, so I'm quite happy They really go for each other, don't they? There's no, like, oh, let's try to be indirect. They're direct. And William showing he's no pushover. And clearly somebody in the crew has red hair. He's a good-looking ginger, sorry. Oh, break it up, you two. I guess it's classic brothers, really. There's definitely competition between the two of them and lots of banter. Harry in the army, William in the RAF, you know, there was always that banter, well, what's better? You know, I'm better because I'm the pilot in the RAF. No, I'm better because I'm, you know, I'm, I'm fighting the Taliban and the British Army. And of course, that was one that Harry always had over William. Yep, William, you're going to be king. That means I can go and fight on the front line. Diana gave Prince Charles an heir and a spare. Harry was the spare. He's always lived up to that. And later in life, he would probably go down the wrong path because of that. William was steered always on his track 
to monarchy. These royals play to win, but there. Many people said it was unfair, but I always thought a straight race was the best way of deciding who should be next in line to the throne. Harry and William obviously love their sport. Maybe they get it from their mum. She took part in that parents' race at school, didn't she? She certainly did, Deborah. Look at her. Shoes off, floaty dress, casually pretending that she hasn't been training at dawn for this for the last three months. And they're off. A cornucopia of early 90s school-run fashion on display. And it's Diana from Floral Cardigan. Bandage out short skirt and business jacket is on the outside. Pearl earrings coming up fast. And it's Pearl earrings who takes it. In that big skirt, did she really try to win? It was the skirt that held her back. Diana finishing in fourth, and sadly, two of the mums were disqualified after testing positive for nandrolone. She is livid, and she should not even a medal winner. Here, the princes are preparing for a spot of polo, but one prince has found himself in a spot of bother, much to his brother's amusement. You're an idiot. Get this on camera. Ah, you forgot your boots. <laughs> oh, my God. That's another classic. Yeah, you borrow my one. Some more has got. Imagine forgetting one's riding boots at a polo match, and they say that the royals are out of touch. Could be worse. I once brought my horse to a game of water polo. Poor thing almost drowned. Yes, I'm not just doing it. I'm not just doing it for them, I always do it. <laughs> Charles and his boys used to have a very joshing relationship when they were growing up. Thank you, but I'm well surprised you scored a goal, actually. Surprise? Yeah. <laughs> well, well, anyway, I like can that. do it even at my advanced stage of decrepitude. You're very good. <laughs> it's always been a very joshing relationship. Humour and, uh, you know, not necessarily wit. So much as joshing. I'm just making nuisance of myself. A nuisance of yourself? Yes, Pa. Sorry. That's not very difficult, is it? Well, it's hereditary, so. <laughs> Touche. Yes, even the heir to the throne isn't immune from a royal ribbing. I think most people think that Harry is the joker in the pack, and they never look towards William's sense of humour. He does have a sense of humour, but I'm sure it's played behind closed doors. In fact, it was William's mother who started off this trip back in 1986, when she and Prince Charles were given a tour around the smashing new Pinewood Studios. The old sugar glass. Let me just... <laughs> <laughs> I hit him on the ball spot. Sugar glass is quite strong. I've used it before. I haven't smashed anyone over the head with it, but I was told to be careful. I had to jump through a window. <laughs> 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 that she was going to have an opportunity of a lifetime. She was handed a fake glass bottle. You better give her two. <laughs> wow, well, years of pent-up frustration and emotion was racing through her veins as she smashed it on the Prince of Wales' head. Oh, what pleasure that gave her. <laughs> You see, poor Charles, of course, knows what's coming and almost begs her, please, please. And she makes sure she obliges by giving him exactly what he doesn't want. Oh, that was a hard hit. That was a hard hit. I was like, maybe you've given me the wrong one. Maybe this one isn't sugar. It's actually glass. That was a hard hit. Can we watch that again? Too hard. <laughs> One wonders, knowing what of course we know now, whether Diana really did give it just that little bit extra blow onto Charles's head. I mean, clearly, he was going to be the only target for her that day. You begin to see a line from past to present. She loved it. She told me all about it. She said, I loved it. I just loved it. And everybody saw it. Imagine Diana's surprise when she realised the glass was fake. I think they should have that. You should have that. In every, like, six years of your marriage or relationship, you can go to a little retreat where you can just smash stuff over each other just to get the frustration out. Don't harm nobody. We're not advocating violence here. Just release of tension. <laughs> what started off, I'm sure, as friendly banter about the quality of Series 3 of Suits may have gone too far if this awkward interview is anything to go by. All the work you
together is great, but working together as family, do you ever have disagreements about things? <laughs> <laughs> oh, yes. <laughs> <laughs> Megan just kind of went... <laughs> It is William's slightly awkward laugh that gives it all away. And of course, knowing what we know now about what at that time was really going on behind the scenes, you know, this is no family banter, sort of digging at each other. You know, there was a major family feud. Yeah, healthy, healthy disagreement. Okay, the last thing you disagree on, how do you resolve it? Uh, I can't remember, they come so thick and fast. <laughs> But, it's, but it's, is it resolved? We don't know. Oh, we don't know. Well, you're putting on a great show if it's not. <laughs> putting on a great show? Wow. Oh, it makes me feel sad because in the end, whether they're royal or not, they're family, and it's just sad for a family to fall out. I think it's really good that, the, that we've got, you know, four, four different personalities and opinions, and I think those opinions work really, really well. <laughs> Girl, you know, just really low-level problems, definitely not, you know, massive disagreements that have been really you know, simmering under the surface. Working as, as family does have its challenges, of course it does. Everybody here, the fact that everyone's laughing means that everybody <laughs> knows exactly what it's like. It's not looking great. Kate stays so quiet as well, doesn't she? She doesn't give, she doesn't give much away. But, um, look, you know, we're, we're, we're stuck together for the rest of our lives, so... The body language between them is like, oh, God, <laughs> so I just keep... Togetherness, that it's Togetherness, fine, yeah, yeah. <laughs> together, because the word is back, together. Oh, together. Feels really ironic, doesn't it, now? Obviously, everything's fine, you know. We're not going to move to LA or anything. <laughs> On to William and Catherine, channeling their inner Robin Hood. One of the things that the couple did in Bhutan was take um, part in a game of archery, which is one of the national games. By Jove, I hit him. I remember being there and watching Kate. She picked up um, the, the, the bow and arrow to shoot it, and it was meant to go in a straight line. <laughs> I mean, it just went so off course. I mean, I think at, at one point it almost looked like she was aiming for the photographers on the other side. That'll make them think twice about snooping around with a telephoto lens when she's sunbathing. For them, I think a lot of fun is had in those moments when it goes off script and the unexpected happens. In the next part, we've got swearing, uh, groping, he's goosed her, and Dad's DJ. Sing that crazy rhythm. <laughs> Don't move a royal muscle. <laughs> Welcome back to Royal Family Cockups. Not one mention of the Duke of York yet. Is that about to change? Lawyers tell me, no, it is not. The royals, boys, elegant and noble creatures. Well, not all the time. Prince Philip has never been backwards in coming forwards. Phil drops the F-bomb as frequently as he unveils plaques. That look, <laughs> the look, it's not like he just swore. I was like, he gave him the look like, listen, mate, what you saying she is, yeah? If you, if you don't want it to kick off, take a picture, mate. All right, or we can take this outside. Do you want a bit of this? Do you want a bit of this? He doesn't put up with any nonsense, never has, never will. He smells manure at 50 paces and just will not tolerate it in his drawing room. When Harry and Meghan attended the Grenfell cookbook launch, Harry lived up to his more prominent title of the Prince of Mischief by stealing some food. <laughs> Give up the sandwich, Harry. You've been busted. If only I knew someone who could tell us an anecdote about the royals and food. Oh, hello, Katie. A favourite story of mine was during a tour of um, Canada in 2016, where the couple was served a local delicacy of clams that just were so phallic. I mean, they looked like penises. And there was no mistaking that they looked like penises. And you could see William and Kate just looking at them, knowing that they were going to have to tackle them, put one in their mouths, and just jolly well get on with it. The best thing to do is have a good giggle about it. And that's exactly what they did. And of course, those were the front page pictures the next day. Two days after the birth of his third child, William 
attended the Anzac Day ceremony at Westminster Abbey. He may have been there in body, but he definitely wasn't there in spirit. <laughs> you can almost hear the Peppa Pig theme tune repeating in his head. Pay close attention to Charles's hand in this next clip. As he puts his hand on the railing, oh, oh the hand around the back, and he's goosed her. How rude. So Prince Charles finds he has something sticky on his hand, and he puts his arm around Princess Diana and wipes it on her white dress. I mean, he could well have been wiping it onto the suit of the person standing next to her, but it looks suspiciously like Diana's white skirt. I thought, initially, he was just sort of, you know, giving a loving, fairly sexual grab, but no, it's something even worse. It's like an animal who's, you know, done a poo and just goes, well... That's not very gentlemanly, is it? I think Diana would have been incredibly annoyed. You've been royally busted, Charlie boy. One is definitely not amused. Attached. Harry and Meghan's now infamous engagement interview here, royally dissected by our cock-up catching celebs. No, I, I'd never, yeah. never even heard about her until this friend said Meghan Markle. I was like, right, okay, give me, give me a background. <laughs> what's, like, what's going on here? Never heard of Meghan Markle. Never heard of it, but you've seen it, haven't you? You've seen it, Big Daddy. Come on. So no, I'd never, I'd, I'd never watched Suits. I'd, I'd never heard of Megan before. Mm. I definitely didn't, you know, watch Suits. The thing was just perfect. It was this beautiful woman just sort of literally tripped and fell into my life. I <laughs> fell into her life. She's gripping his hand really tight, and she's thinking, stick to the script, Harry. She was sitting there. I was like, okay, well, I really have to up, up, up my game. <laughs> <laughs> Megan, did I, did I say everything right? Was that, was that? And she's like, you did well, Harry. And you're like, thanks, Megan. I've noticed about Megan when she is not lost for words, but wants to kind of distract or dismiss something. She goes, <laughs> sends kind of head roll. <laughs> we see you, Megan. We see you. Nothing is more awful than being played in public. He was markled and had a complete personality transplant and out went the levity and in came the gravitas but it's not a genuine gravitas it's very weighty money and people rarely don't be like they are not as important as they think they are and they are certainly not as well informed and they are certainly not as evolved or as well educated and they dare to lecture us I mean, who hell do they think they are? I mean, they are entirely above themselves. And they need to remember their place. Charles. The Queen here giving a commemorative speech in honour of Charles's 50th birthday at Buckingham Palace. In fact, before we hear from the birthday boy himself, here's Paul Burrell to explain the protocol around how to address Her Majesty. The first time you address Her Majesty the Queen, it's Your Majesty. The second time, in conversation, it's ma'am, as in jam. Not ma'am, it's ma'am. Get it right. Mummy. <laughs> Coupled with Your Majesty, I really am enormously grateful. Charles royally cocked up there. Harry being awarded his provisional flying wings by none other than his very own daddy. So sweet. Seems even royals get excited to meet the royals. In, in this footage, you, you see the, the mutual respect between father and son. You've got the, the future king presenting Harry with his wings. So a really important moment in Harry's military career. Did, he, did Prince Charles shake everyone else's hand? I want him to hug him. Hello, young man. What do you do? Well, I, uh, I just sort of open stuff and, and present plaques. Yeah, that's exactly what I do. Oh, that is such a moment. Hug him! <laughs> Break the code! It's very strange. To the outside world, we see it as a sterile environment where...
love is involved. But behind closed doors, they do embrace. I think Harry and Charles has quite a good, Prince Harry and Prince Charles have quite a good relationship because their little, like, little sneaky ways, their little banners together, that's just the tip of the iceberg. <laughs> Two hundred and fifty million people tuned in to watch the royal wedding of the century. Therefore, one would hope Lady Di would know the name of the man she's about to marry. I, Diana Francis. I, Diana Francis. Take thee, Charles Philip Arthur George. Take thee, Philip Charles Arthur George. Ah. Oh. She royally cocked that up. At least no one noticed. Take thee, Charles Philip Arthur George. The Duke and Duchess of Cambridge try their hand at DJing while on tour in Australia. Kate seems pretty good, actually. I wonder if she learnt it from her father-in-law. <laughs> <laughs> what a tune. <laughs> oh, take that crazy rhythm. <laughs> take that crazy rhythm. Take that crazy rhythm. <laughs> crazy insane. Did he just say dig that crazy rhythm? No, you didn't. No, you didn't, Charles. No, I've got to hear that again. Did he just say dig that crazy rhythm? Dig that crazy rhythm. <laughs> right. <I> mean... <laughs> Charles' his enthusiasm is commendable, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's it. I couldn't hear it before. He is always prepared to just embrace the situation, doesn't care if he comes across looking a bit silly, he will give it a shot, whether it's break dancing or, or rapping, he will go for it. And I think that earned him a lot of fans over the years. You're listening to uh, The Prince of Funk. It's DJ Chaz on 103.2. Uh, I've had a text in from Martin who's damaged his penis in the zipper of his trousers. Ouch. This one's for you, Martin. It's torn by Natalie Imbruglia. <laughs> Nothing coming, is it? And he's done. <laughs> Martin McCutcheon is among the famous faces remembering less than perfect moments in their teen years. Rod Gilbert's Growing Pains is brand new Wednesday at 9 over on Comedy Central. is living a fairy tale with a prince by her side and a castle of her own. Frogmore is a royal residence. It is very grand. One of the nicest things about Frogmore Cottage is that it is just a stone's throw away from the Queen's residence at Windsor Castle. After a four million dollar upgrade, it's decorated for a duchess. Velvet sofas, old mirrors, colored cushions. There is a granny annex for the glamorous granny Doria. Megan's keen to have a space for yoga. Life as a princess may be privileged. The butlers, the chauffeurs. The cleaners, the cooks. It's all very Downton-esque. But Megan's every move is in the public eye. Probably the most difficult part of marrying into the royal family would be the fact that there's no privacy. I think I find it quite difficult having people around you the whole time. So she needs her palace to be a private sanctuary. It's countryside, it's private, it's included. It has a ball built around the property. They can literally throw open their doors and windows, be totally free, totally private. And now Baby makes three. It's going to be a, a much smaller, intimate household in which they want to bring up their baby. We know that they're going for a grey in the nurse, which yeah. I think is actually very chic. Um, it's going to be the chicest baby there is. Well, I, I should imagine. hope so. How will Meghan redefine what it means to live like a royal? They want craziness of being a member of the royal family to end when they go inside their homes. It's a very modern princess thing to do, I think. Modern princess, I like that. Marrying a royal has given Meghan Markle access to one of the world's most famous real estate portfolios. As the current reigning monarch, the Queen's actually one of the biggest property tycoons in the country. The Queen has a property empire where Billions. Everything from cottages, castles, palaces, all up and down the country. Windsor, Sandringham. Holyrood House. Clarence House. Anne Hall. Buckingham Palace. Balmoral. Frogmore Cottage. 
Kensington Palace, there's a very sumptuous palace in the middle of London. With so many properties, the Queen has plenty of space to house her family. After Meghan and Harry said, I do, she needed to find them a palatial pad. It's long been tradition in the royal family for newlyweds to receive a home to start their new royal family life. And the Queen is also being very practical. They need somewhere to live that is secure, that affords them the life that they would like to live, that gives them enough private space while also recognising that they are royal. She doesn't sit there sort of with a monopoly board. What is it that you would like? Where would you like to be living? Then she looks to see what's available. When we got married, we, we didn't quite receive a house, did we? <laughs> Maybe a toaster. It's a small sausage dog for our wedding <laughs> present. The Queen's youngest son, Edward, and wife, Sophie, got lucky with their wedding gift in 1999. They live in one of the Queen's most splendid houses, a Victorian Gothic mansion with 57 rooms set in 87 acres. Bagshot Park is one of the largest properties that the Queen's given out to her children or grandchildren. It so big that just a few years ago, Edward and Sophie had to hire a programme coordinator just to look after the various members of staff. There's the glass coach driving directly past our camera. When the perfect property isn't available, the Queen goes shopping. She splashed the cash to buy her daughter her dream home. Princess Anne and Captain Mark Phillips, who she married, were both very, very keen horse people. and. Um, they married. There were no properties available within the royal portfolio. And so the Queen found um, Gatcombe Park for them, which is absolutely perfect for their equestrian needs. Gatcombe Park is very much a working farm, and there are saddles and riding boots and hay. There is no one is standing on ceremony. The Queen funded her second son, Prince Andrew, when he and wife Sarah Ferguson built their own home. They designed and built this huge country house, not far from Windsor, called Sunning Hill Park. It seemed to be very brash and modern and very un unroyal. It was of a time. It was of the 80s, and the 80s were not the most beautiful, <laughs> I imagine inside it was filled with pelmets of swags of shot silk everywhere. In if you look at how Fergie dressed in the 80s, I imagine it would look like that. I'm like big puff shoulders. shoulders, like the curtains reflecting that. For sure. It was immediately labelled South York after South York, the Dallas television series. I thought it looked more like a Tesco supermarket. But yeah, Fergie and Andrew took it on the chin. They didn't care. They loved living there, and it's where they began raising their children. But the house didn't last much longer than the marriage. It was sold to a Kazakh oligarch who let it fall into disrepair and then pulled it down. The Queen gifted and William use of an apartment in Kensington Palace and Anne Hall on her Sandringham estate in Norfolk. William obviously has been going to Sandringham since he was a dot, so he knows that area very well. It's relatively private. Part of William and Kate's decision to go to Norfolk was because they had this very tight-knit group of friends there. The Turnip Toffs, these would be very people who'd been mates with the Queen and Prince Charles, you know, multiple generations. That area of Norfolk in the summer is very happening for posh people. North Norfolk, the coastline, it's got very beautiful beaches, big houses where other sort of posh earls and friends of the royal family live, lots of big estates. It's certainly a very popular posh British hangout. With so many homes already gifted, what was left for Meghan and Harry? The Queen found them Frogmore Cottage, a Desrez hidden away on the Windsor Castle estate. It makes sense to me that Harry and Meghan wanted to move to Windsor. For obvious reasons, Frogmore is very personal to them because it's they held their wedding reception, it's where they did their engagement photographs. Harry has spent a lot of time in Windsor when he was at school at Eton. He loves Windsor. It's not too far from the City of London, so they can easily get into town, but they've got the best of both worlds. It's countryside, it's private, it's secluded, secluded isn't it? Frogmore itself has this fantastic history. Victoria adored it, that's why she wanted Albert to be buried. And all sorts of fascinating people have lived at Frogmore Cottage, including Abdul Karim, who was Victoria's favourite Indian servant. And she, uh, they used to curry together, they used to talk about India together. They had this incredibly intimate friendship. 
One of the nicest things about Frogmore Cottage is that it is just a stone's throw away from the Queen's residence at Windsor Castle. You're not far away from the Long Walk, and from there it's straight up to Windsor Castle itself. And I think for the Queen, having one of her favourite grandchildren nearby is quite a nice little luxury. You know, I'm sure that would have gone through her mind when she gave Frogmore Cottage to Harry and Meghan. Meghan and Harry's new home was under wraps for months, while a team of builders blitzed it inside and out. Frogmore Cottage needed huge amounts of renovation. Um, they reported three million the, pounds. Yes, three million pounds worth of renovation. It was previously five separate uh, staff apartments for staff working in Windsor Castle and of course needed to be returned back into one home and a very different home to what it used to be as well. There is a granny annex for the glamorous granny Doria who's going to be flying in. Heathrow's so close so it makes sense that there's somewhere for her to stay when she comes to look after the baby and visit the family. Harry and Meghan are a modern family. They want certain spaces that weren't even thought of in previous eras. Meghan's keen to have a space for yoga, and Harry wants a home gym. You know, these are things that members of the royal family didn't have in the past. Meghan has opted for a very large grand staircase in the entrance with a double set of stairs either side. You can imagine gone with the wind. It's quite an American move, I would say. I think so. I think the whole place is going to be a mishmash of very British and some American traditions. And this grand staircase, you can imagine, you know, the car waiting outside as she sweeps down the stairs in a ball gown off to a, a glamour. Meghan's in-laws, Kate and William, also took on a major renovation at their London home, Kensington Palace. It had once belonged to the Queen's sister. When Princess Margaret had apartment 1A in the late 60s, 70s, it was very luxurious. It was beautifully decorated, very bold blue colours on the walls. She had a wonderful sink in her bathroom that was pale pink, an orchid-shaped sink. I mean, I, I think I would have loved that more than any of them. Princess Margaret was the polar opposite to her sister. Where Elizabeth was always rather frugal and restrained, Margaret lived in a much more extravagant way. She had a much greater sense of style than her sister. Her flat at Kensington Palace was famed for, for rather wild parties. But the apartment was neglected after Margaret's death in 2002 and rapidly deteriorated. When William and Kate took over apartment 1A, it needed extensive work. The windows, the roof, pipework, electrics. There was asbestos, there was really bad wiring, heating that hadn't been updated. So it was a massive renovation job because it is quite a big property. For you and I doing up a home, we're going to be thinking about the bedroom bathrooms and the kitchen and that's about it. For William and Kate there were 22 rooms to think about. It might be a palace but the Cambridges were keen to lead a modern domestic lifestyle. It was important that the kitchen would be the heart of that home so it was the first time actually that apartment 1A had a proper kitchen installed that a family could use not just a chef. It is Kate and William doing the majority of that cooking themselves. Kate came from a, a, a pretty regular family home where lunch around a kitchen table, entertaining in that way was really important. And I think it's great that she wants to continue that tradition with her family and her children. It's a very modern princess thing to do, I think. Modern princess, I like that. There was a report that the Queen didn't quite understand why would they want another kitchen? Because surely that's where the staff work. And of course, that's the life that she knows. Although the royals spent four dollars on the renovation of Meghan's home and around 1.3 million on Kate's, the Queen likes to be frugal when it comes to her own homes. The Queen is very aware that many of the people in the country don't have much money, only have small houses, lots of people don't even own their own home. She's very aware of her public image and unlike many other royals before and since, she really hasn't renovated the palaces very greatly. They remind her of her happy childhood with her parents. She has moved into what they are and been happy with what she has. However, after years of neglect, the Queen had to give Buckingham Palace a much-needed makeover. 2016 saw the start of a 10-year renovation project. It's a lot on the dilapidated side. Bits were frankly falling off, chunks of masonry from the portico. One nearly hit Princess Anne a few years ago. It's incredibly run down in the places that we, the public, don't get to see and requires a lot of money to bring it up to any kind of livable state. Much of the palace's 100 miles of electric cable 
and 20 miles of heating pipework will be replaced in the $480 million refurbishment. Now, much of Buckingham Palace hasn't been touched in 50 or 60 years, so there's boilers that are leaking, there's asbestos, there's dodgy wiring, there's so much that hasn't been replaced. A major justification for the Buckingham Palace renovation was to avoid a catastrophic fire like the one which ravaged Windsor Castle in 1992. The Queen was devastated by the Windsor Castle fire. She really sees herself as a keeper of royal history. So to see it go up in flames as quickly and voraciously as it did was devastating. The firemen, they were amazing. Prince Andrew did a very good job of sort of leading a chain where they were getting all the artifacts out, the art and the priceless antiques. Imagine it's actually devastating. Um, she is present in, in, inside the castle, um, helping to uh, take stuff out of the castle, works smart. The castle needed a five-year, $50 million restoration to repair the destruction. When they were doing the renovation, they did think, now that it's a, a burnt-out heap, how can we make this more energy-efficient moving forward? How can we make sure that we restore it to its former glory, but make sure that the wiring is correct this time around? So, yes, they were able to use it to correct some old issues and bring it uh, up to the present day. As a future Queen Consort, the Duchess of Cambridge has to combine royal heritage, contemporary style, and the needs of three young children in her home. Although apartment 1A is the family home, William and Kate do use it for official purposes. It's a potential palace for them when they are king and queen of the country, and apartment 1A has to adhere to strict royal traditions. Whilst it's their home, it also needs to perform those formal functions, and it's mixing that traditional with the modern vibes. So getting the interior design right was critical, Kate called in the professionals. I knew that Ben Pentreath was helping Kate. He is very traditional, he likes guilt, and he puts things around fireplaces. Posh people are obsessed with fireplaces and mantelpieces, and then they have these sort of seats that you can sit on around fireplaces. Ben Pentreath is perhaps the perfect designer for this space because he naturally, instinctively mixes the traditional and the modern. He uses touches of colour that bring a space into a more contemporary setting, and he... Bernard Thorpe received the royal seal of approval when Kate visited to pick out fabrics. When they've got a new client, interior designers will come to us. They'll probably have an idea in their mind of the look they're trying to achieve will help them to pull out those things that we think they're looking for and then they'll usually come back with their clients who probably want to see larger pieces of the samples they liked. I love the fact that Kate was very hands-on when it came to the interior design of the apartment. She actually went shopping for the house and uh, she took part in the whole process. It would be very easy to sit back and have things presented to you um, but it doesn't have your personality. I think to have something that really means something to you you need to have chosen it yourself to put the hard work in. We eventually got a glimpse of William and Kate's taste in April 2016. When they invited the Obamas over when they were visiting the UK, we got to see their formal living room. People were very excited. All the newspapers were zooming in on various parts of the official photograph. My first impression of the Barack and Will picture was actually that it was quite traditional. But when you start to break it down and look in more detail, you can see those modern touches. It's very gorgeous, and the fashion at the moment is for elephant's breath and buttermilk and magnolia. The curtains are a little bit too long, which I love. It's quite casual and relaxed. Yeah. They're obviously a, a sort of natural fabric, there's some texture there. It, it just is a nod to a slightly more casual. The loosening of the tie, if you like. Yes. I was lucky enough to go inside apartment 1A. I've had a lot to take in. Got George coming down the stairs in his pajamas to say hello to Barack and Michelle, and uh, of course Kate and William. The place itself is very impressive. It's very formal. A lot of artwork on the walls. The juxtaposition of the Lucite table with the demi lune behind, gold gilt demi lune no less, is just showing very stark contrast between the old and the new. We've seen Kate shopping in places like John Lewis and very sort of, I guess, normal everyday department stores in the UK. And you can see touches of that around the home. I think it's a little bit older than perhaps what we'd expect for a couple in their 30s. Kate and William are a relatively young couple, so I expected their apartment to reflect that a bit more. But instead, we saw uh, something which you sort of expect in Buckingham Palace, which might have been a room that had looked the same for sort of 200 years. I just thought there might have been a more relaxed 
vibe to it, and there wasn't. But then on the other hand, they do need to have a certain level of grandeur in these rooms. But I think there's a way of doing grandeur and not making it look quite so, so sort of 18th century. <laughs> Meghan and Harry are known to have more contemporary tastes and want a cooler vibe for Frogmore Cottage. Meghan has a more relaxed uh, style than Kate's, fewer dead rallies on the walls perhaps, more contemporary art. Harry and Meghan, I think, are creating more of a kind of hotel bar. We got a glimpse inside Meghan's home in Toronto and she clearly loved white furnishings. It was all very clean, fairly monochromatic. It was cosy still, but she loved big white flowers. Everything was kind of white. And actually there's a, a flower seller outside St. Mary's Church on Kensington High Street and Meghan regularly buys flowers from her and she said she always buys white flowers. Harry and Meghan's first date was at an outpost of Soho House, Dean Street Townhouse. So they, since the very beginning, have uh, been big fans of this chain. It makes sense that they've hung out there. It's very fashionable, lots of celebrities are members. And then we know now that Vicky Charles, who was the group design director for Soho House for 20 years, has been designing Frogmore Cottage. And so it's really her vision. If you go to a Soho House, it's quite shabby chic. Velvet sofas, old mirrors, sort of multicolored cushions, log stoves. The interiors there are all about atmosphere and creating somewhere that is really safe and comfortable and elegant. And I think we're going to see a lot of that translated into Frogmore. I think there's going to be lots of warm layers and textures and perhaps some colour as well. And this modern style even extends to baby Sussex's nursery. We're actually using a vegan organic paint, which is scented with rosemary and eucalyptus. eucalyptus. We know that they're going for a grey in the nursery, which yeah. I think is actually very chic. Um, it's going to be the chicest baby there is. Well, Can I should imagine? hope so. For Meghan and Harry, Frogmore Cottage is an idyllic escape from Kensington Palace, where they first set up home together. The palace is in the centre of London and surrounded by onlookers. Probably the most difficult part of marrying into the royal family would be the, the fact that there's no privacy, or very little privacy. The governess of the Queen said when the Queen was a child, royals are only private in the womb. Kensington Palace also houses multiple generations of royals. It's essentially an upmarket housing estate full of Windsors. Margaret was there, Princess Margaret, the Duke and of Kent, the Duke and Duchess of Gloucester, Prince and Princess Michael of Kent, and now we've got a new generation, William and Kate and their three children, George, Charlotte and Louis. They now occupy apartment 1A, Eugenie and Jack. They live in Ivy Cottage. Harry and Meghan were living at Nottingham Cottage. It's a lovely, cosy two-bedroom cottage. Of course, it's where Harry famously proposed to Meghan. The palace was William and Harry's childhood home. Their mother, Diana, moved there in 1981, along with many of her staff and their families. My father had been working in the press office for Charles and Diana. He was one of their press secretaries. It was actually very special living at Kensington Palace. I was, I was in my late teens, and we would see William and Harry coming and going with their nanny. Diana would liken Kensington Palace to Coronation Street. I guess that's the, the very English version of, of Melrose Place. Kensington Palace is filled, stuffed with all the royals, all living together. I can't imagine living with my in-laws in that way. It I would think... be crammed in the same space, aren't they? <laughs> it must be like sounds a... mean, but there's, there's a lot of room, but you're right on top of each other. Yeah. I think it's just, you know, when you're living in close quarters with family members, there are curtain twitches, people are sort of watching who's coming and going. Princess Margaret, for many years, lived next door to Diana when she was on her own there. And I think, you know, Princess Margaret was very sympathetic to Diana. But I think there was also a feeling that, that um, the gardens were perhaps overlooked and, and it, it, it was, there was not much privacy there. After Diana separated from Prince Charles in 1992, Kensington Palace was surrounded by press photographers, eager for a shot of the world's most famous single woman. She was constantly seen coming and going because in her era, paparazzi photographers were allowed to stand at the gates. So there was any number of photographs of her driving in and out. Diana was very good at actually dealing with her. You know, reluctantly would give them a smile and a wave and, and look as though that she wasn't bothered. But deep down, yes, she didn't like it. She did see it as an invasion of her privacy. If Diana happened to have a gentleman friend that she wanted to see, yes, they were smuggled in, in in the boot of a car because that was the only way to avoid any kind of scandal, salacious gossip. It probably did feel like something of a gilded cage because she couldn't go anywhere. And that's why she had asked her brother, Charles Spencer, if she could have a bolt hole on, on the Spencer estate. He at first said yes, and then he reneged on that offer because he was worried that there was going to be too much press intrusion. And as a result, he and Diana 
had a frosty relationship. Sadly, they were never able to reconcile. Kensington Palace became the focus of the world's grief after Diana's tragic death in 1997. Harry watched what happened to his mother, and he, I think, is absolutely determined the same thing will not happen to Meghan. Frogmore Cottage gives them absolute privacy and discretion. They're able to raise baby Sussex in the most peaceful environment that's only open to the public three days a year, but it has a ball built around the property. So when that public is there, they will never get to see the Sussexes. I think they're going to love their life there because they can literally throw open their doors and windows, be totally free, totally private, totally secure, and it could be a beautiful place to raise a family. Meghan and Harry may be raising a family now, but they're also taking on more royal duties as the Queen steps back. So where do they escape to when they need a break from the day job? When you're at royal, you can't just pop to a hotel in France for your holiday. It would just be chaos. So you have to use your palaces. You have to go to Balmoral for the summer, Sandringham for Christmas. Meghan was invited to spend Christmas with the royals at Sandringham before her marriage. It was King George V that said there was no better place, I'm paraphrasing, but no better place that he loved than Sandringham. King George VI, the Queen's father, felt the same way. And for someone who's never been Queen for 67 years, there's very few opportunities where you're not on duty. She has memories in those places with her own family as well, so those moments are to be cherished. The Prince of Wales bought himself a hideaway of his own, just before his marriage to Diana. Highgrove is very much a, a Georgian country house. It's got a nice atmosphere about it. It's just got a much more um, family-orientated feel. It's a place he loves to spend the most amount of time. It's a place he feels most at peace. But Highgrove isn't everyone's idea of the perfect hideaway. I think Camilla finds Highgrove it, it's Charles's place. It's not their place. He lived there with, with Diana. I guess quite a lot of her memories will be from the Diana years, when the War of the Wales is, was in full flood, when the ghastly tape recordings were being published of their late-night conversations. It was a very difficult time for her and a very painful time for her. And the place she and Charles love to be together is Balmoral, up in Scotland. That is, I think, where they are at their most relaxed. Charles inherited his passion for Scotland from his mother. The Queen really loves Balmoral. It is her beloved place, and I'm not sure whether any monarch ever again will love Balmoral like the Queen. I think she just loves the family time that she's afforded them. The Queen ensures she's surrounded by family at this remote Scottish castle, inviting William, Kate, Harry and Meghan to spend summer holidays there. Only a few privileged guests from outside the family get to join them. My dad has a great story. He got to go up to Balmoral and the Queen invited him and their other guests for the weekend on a picnic. And then after the picnic, everybody clears up together. And he went to the sink and he didn't really pay attention to the person standing next to him. He just said, as one would, I'll wash you dry. And this voice very curtly says, no, I'll wash you dry. And it was the Queen. <laughs> She's not precious. Yes, we want her to behave like the Queen when we're seeing her out in public, but I kind of love that she's like the nation's favourite granny, too. And when Meghan stays at Balmoral, she'll need to be careful what she packs. I know that um, Cherie Blair, the wife of the former Prime Minister Tony Blair, the Prime Minister's always invited to go and stay up at Balmoral, the Queen's Scottish castle, and Cherie had packed and didn't realise the first year they went that a, a butler or valet would unpack for her. I was then mortified to find out later that... that They'd unpacked her stuff and her contraception had been put in a bathroom cupboard. This is why they say their son Leo came about, because when they went back the next year, she didn't pack contraception, supposedly, because she was so embarrassed at the thought of that. ...fixture on the Queen's calendar. But is it really the perfect summer vacation spot for Kate and Meghan? Kate loves that same royal lifestyle. She loves all the outdoorsy things. She wants to be surrounded by dogs and out in the stream. Megan, I'm not sure. She's a California girl. So while I think she would appreciate the countryside, I think she'd find Scotland quite tough. Uh, Megan's made no secret of how much she loves the sunshine and yoga outside on the beach. And, and Balmoral, you've got to be made of pretty stern stuff because it can be very cold up there, even in the middle of August. I'm sure she will go because Harry will want to go and she'll want to go and, and share that part of his life with him. But I'm not sure we will see them go for perhaps the same length of time as they would have done in previous years.
Meghan and Harry will be spending a lot of time at Buckingham Palace. They have a suite of rooms there to house their support staff and provide them with a London crash pad. The palace is also the Queen's office and needs a cavalry of staff to keep the wheels rolling. There is a difference between the Queen and the younger royals in terms of servants. So essentially, the Queen has the biggest staff. Not only is Buckingham Palace the hugest uh, residence, but also uh, her needs in terms of events, her political work. There is still a huge amount of state visits to her. So the staff necessarily has to be very large. There's 450 Buckingham Palace staff working just on the private residences there, and that's not including the spaces that they're open to the public or to any of the kind of garden spaces. It's a very busy palace, from the footmen, the private secretaries, the butlers, the chauffeurs, the cleaners, the cooks, the office staff, the PR, the housemaids, the housekeeper. It's all very Downton-esque. The royals have jobs done for them that we don't. The man who winds the clocks. There's 450 clocks in Windsor and 1,000 clocks in Buckingham Palace. The clock winder at Windsor Castle, it said it took him 16 hours to wind up all the clocks there. So by the time you've done one load of clocks, you've got to start all over again. The dresser is something that seems a very unique royal job. They will organize the outfits, they will sort out everything with the dry cleaners, they will pack everything, and they will also help to dress you. The Queen's relationships with her dressers is incredible, and there's a brilliant story that one time two of her dressers were arguing so much that she came down to the servants' quarters to bed down because she just didn't want to interrupt, because they're both so important to her. She didn't want to interrupt and get in the middle of the fight. The Queen has her own shoe breaker in her, and why not? She has a lot of walking to do. They are custom-made shoes. The shoe breaker in her takes them, and walks around Buckingham Palace until they are the perfect level of softness for the Queen to wear. Some of the traditional jobs at the palace might seem rather eccentric to a modern day princess. Um, for the Queen at Buckingham Palace, things are a little different. She has a piper, a bagpiper, that plays for her every morning without fail. She loves the sound of the bagpipes and for her that's the perfect way to start the day. The royal footmen have the key job of looking after the royal court and sometimes they are a bit resentful that they don't get to serve the actual boils because the corgis have a lot of needs. Fresh chicken, fresh meat, cooked for them freshly, put in their bowls, their, their bowls and their baskets are off the ground so they don't get drafts. And some footmen in the past have been a little bit frustrated by this. When Meghan's at the palace, every royal servant she comes into contact with by a strict code of conduct. The house is packed full of people. It, you're really supposed to try and be as inobtrusive as possible because you cannot bump into a royal. So it's not an equal sharing of the house. It is the royal's house. And so if they are trying to get somewhere, you need to get out of the way. And that's, that's the way it works. And all staff are sworn to secrecy. It's the fear that even the most trusted servant might one day sell his soul and your story innermost secrets will be splashed across the front page of a newspaper. There have been royal members of staff who've gone on to a degree of fame, notoriety, to a degree of financial reward. I think the most fascinating story is Miss Marion Crawford, who was the governess of the Queen and Princess Margaret when they were little girls. She went with them to Buckingham Palace when their father became king. She was there for the courtship between Elizabeth and Philip, and she was such a trusted member of the household. They, were, they told her everything, they were devoted to her, and when she left, the household, she wrote a book about the princesses, about everything. And this was published in America. Now this incredibly private family, all these secrets are laid bare. And the royal family were really shocked. They were shocked, they felt betrayed, and they never spoke to her ever again. If you leave and you talk, then that is the end of any relationship you've ever had with the royals. Harry's been brought up with servants, but for Meghan it's a whole new and luxurious way of life. Prince Charles's former butler, Grant trains staff to cater for the famous, rich and royal. At the state dinner at Buckingham Palace, good in cutlery, always goes at the top. As well as doing all the traditional things you expect, I teach them how to shake hands, how to sit down correctly, how to uh, walk correctly. When you do a breakfast tray in a, say, a royal home, the teapot, to make sure that it's already pre-warmed. We've got some toast. Royal homes, stately homes, they tend to cut the off. 
Now, there was an old rule from years ago that married ladies could have because they weren't married and they were looking for a husband. Princess Margaret famously used to be brought a breakfast tray, I think, at 9 o'clock every morning, and then she spent the next two hours lying in bed, reading the papers and chain-smoking. Mm. Try to keep it level as you go up the stairs. She'd be brought buttered eggs. She wouldn't ever call... They weren't supposed to be called scrambled eggs because scrambled was deemed common, but buttered eggs supposedly was what she was brought on her breakfast tray. <laughs> You get to this point, knock twice, you just want to... Come in. Good morning. Good morning. Is the trail right here? Perfect, thank you. Meghan can learn from the Queen how to be the hostess with the mostess at her own royal palace. You and I might have a dinner party and invite perhaps six friends round. Um, the Queen very often will have a banquet for hundreds of people at Buckingham Palace. And although she has all these people to do the work, she is actually a fantastically good hostess and quite a proud hostess. And she will go and check the arrangements before any banquet. If she's got a visitor coming to stay, like Barack Obama, Thank you so much for she will inspect the rooms. She will choose which suite of rooms they're going to stay in in Buckingham Palace. And she will check them out. She will select some books to put by their bedsides. And she would generally prepare for a guest like you and I might prepare for a guest. There are even strict rules for those royal guests to follow. If you're lucky enough to go to an event at Buckingham Palace, what might surprise you is that the, the menu will not be in English, it will be written in French, which is a, a very old royal tradition. Uh, it's quite nice and I think it keeps people on their toes as well because when they sit down they've suddenly got to really concentrate on what the menu says. If you're dining with the Queen, you've got to make sure that before the Queen stops eating, you've finished. If you haven't, then unfortunately the staff will come in and take your plate away. But dinner at Meghan's place is likely to be a much more informal affair. Meghan loves to cook, we know that, and she loves to entertain and prepare food for her friends. So I think moving to a much bigger space, we're going to see her entertaining more, lots of private parties with pals, where I think it'll be quite relaxed. I don't think you'd be very relaxed if you were invited over to Meghan's house for a party. Can you imagine? <laughs> Meghan and Harry's more relaxed attitude to protocol means they won't surround themselves with servants. There has been an attempt from the Duke and Duchess of Cambridge to have fewer staff around them. And I think that the trend of the younger royals having a smaller staff is going to be even more intensified with Harry and Meghan setting up home in Frogmore Cottage. I can't think that Meghan and Harry will ever want a, a huge number of staff, but I do think that they will need somebody who will manage whether Harry and Meghan would go the whole hog and have valets and footmen. Harry, I think, finds his father's lifestyle probably a bit over the top. He is of a much younger generation, obviously, um, and he's had a lot of friends, and he's been to their houses, he was in the army. He is probably more comfortable with the frugality than the huge staffing levels and, and luxury. At the last count, Prince Charles had 118 staff, which means he never has to do his own chores. A 2003 documentary shows Harry cleaning his own boots, something his dad can't get his head around. What? Yes, I'm not just doing it for them. I'm not just doing it for them. I always do it. I always clean them. I played yesterday. I didn't have a chance. <laughs> if someone else to do it for you. Huh. Prince Charles famously had valets who did quite a lot for him. They put toothpaste on his toothbrush. Sometimes if you have that level of assistance, it can seem that you're divorced from reality to a degree. There have been a lot of stories about Charles. There is no doubt that he likes his luxury. And he is a bit pampered because he has the staff to pamper him. He does have a very bad back and does like to sleep on his own mattress, if that is humanly possible. And he certainly takes cushions to sit on and to, to put his back against on chairs. The idea that he travels the world with his own lavatory seat is nonsense. The first royal moderniser was William and Harry's mother, the Princess of Wales. Diana was revolutionary. Diana wanted a completely different approach to how royalty dealt with staff. Before her marriage in 1981, she had spent some limited time at Buckingham Palace and was befriended by um, one of the Queen's stewards, who was incredibly helpful to Diana at, at a difficult time. You know, here you have a, an 18, 19-year-old 
and she thought, well, look, you know, maybe that's how I should sort of treat my staff. The protocol before I even went to the cancer palace, you always referred to them in the first thing in the morning, Your Royal Highness, almost from day one when Diana came out of the door and I said, oh, bow my head morning, well, good morning, Your Royal Highness. She said, oh, you can stop all that crap again, you know. You know, she effectively was running the house by speaking to the chefs, you know, speaking to the housekeepers, going to see the chauffeurs, letting them know what her word was, which was a complete change in how royalty dealt with their staff. Diana loved to be down in the kitchens, and, and Harry and William used to go into the kitchen and ask for treats and snacks. I remember hearing from a former palisade that the chef that they had at Kensington Palace used to get frustrated sometimes because Diana would just take it upon herself to go up in the kitchen and make the boys a pudding or put, you know bowls of ice cream, and that was his job. But she just really enjoyed this closeness to staff, which was complete, almost an anathema the prince who found that her relationship with staff was probably too close for comfort. And Diana's sons clearly want more relaxed households. We obviously see William as well not wanting to perhaps have the closeness of a valet that his father did. We only need to look at the Cambridges and see how small their staff are to see how that's kind of inspired the way they bring up their children. A discreet advertisement in the Lady magazine in 2015, seeking a housekeeper, may have been placed on behalf of the Cambridge family. What was interesting was that they wanted one person. They're trying to keep it as minimally staffed as possible because I think they don't want the children growing up. They're already growing up with a very privileged life. So I think William and Kate want to keep them grounded so that they understand that privilege, but that they don't take advantage of that privilege. That's very important. And it'll be no different for Harry and Meghan. It's going to be a, a much smaller, intimate household in which they want to bring up their baby. Will they have a housekeeper? Possibly. It ends there because for them, once the craziness of being a member of the royal family to end when they go inside their homes. As they step onto the international stage, Harry and Meghan will have to balance two extremes, family life and royal life. Frogmore is a royal residence. It belongs to the Crown Estates and it is very grand. So life will be much more royal than it was in the early days when they were together. This royal life will take them across the world and even possibly to a new home. Perhaps they might think about an overseas property, the Hamptons maybe, I can see Harry rocking some swim shorts in the Hamptons. Bit of Ralph Lauren over the shoulders. Yeah. I think mm -hmm. Meghan's gonna want somewhere by the sea, perhaps in California, in Malibu, somewhere where the days are long and the weather is hot. I could even imagine them taking a small apartment in New York, mm -hmm. that would feel Megan. I'd like that. I'd that would like be that. quite nice, wouldn't it? And they'll redefine how the royal family works and lives. In recent years, we've seen William, Kate, Harry and Meghan leading the normalisation of the royal family, taking the royal family into a very new era, making it clear that they are people just like you and I, albeit in much nicer homes. Mm -hmm.